We have the Fed here that has said they're going to do whatever they need to do for inflation. Right now, the market is giving the Fed basically a green light to go by 100 basis point at the July meetings. What I'm concerned about is the Fed focusing so much on the headline inflation. They're losing track of an economy which is losing momentum. When risk assets are moving this fast, the risk assets take over economic data. The market's starting to price in a much higher probability of a recession. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrow, Lisa Bramowitz, and Tom Keen. Bloomberg Surveillance on a Friday to get you through the weekend and through July to the Fed meeting, July 27. Lisa, I don't know where to begin. Let's begin with Slow China, Iron Ore down 53%. Copper down 34%. I am so glad you talked about this because right now what we heard overnight was the Chinese <clears throat> government themselves putting out official data that confirmed the slowdown that people were looking at. And Tom, it is shocking to see the slowdown, but even more shocking to see the People's Bank of China reflect that with some accuracy, highlighting this question, the quagmire that they're facing right now. All the debates about the American economy, and we'll get that through the show today, but Lisa, I just want to pause back to April 12, April 13, when the World Trade Organization came out and said 3%, sub 3% global growth, and everybody said, yeah, maybe. Well, here it is. Yeah, well, here is really uh, the issue and the delicate balance. And we heard it from J.P. Morgan yesterday. Everyone sees the clouds. This is the most expected recession ever, if you look at this as a potential yeah, recession sure. globally. Yeah, yeah. So how do we look at the now mm. that still looks pretty good? And that was what J.P. Morgan's Jamie Dimon was trying to parse through. And that's what we're going to get from Citigroup and Wells Fargo potentially today. Bank earnings today, of course, Amory Horton with the president in Jeddah and a most historic trip. We'll see that uh, flight about 8.30 New York time. Matt Miller, the cacophony of items here. Let me just go to an open question to you. What in the market has your attention? Well, yesterday we saw Mike McKee sit down with the Fed's Chris yes, Waller. Yes. And he said he's going to be watching. Waller <laughs> will be watching very closely the retail numbers that we're going to get out today. I just spoke with Allison Williams from Bloomberg Intelligence, and she said we're going to get really key data on um, the consumer from Citi as well today, as we got yesterday from JP Morgan. So I think the consumer, the U.S. consumer is what I'm watching first and foremost. I mean, Matt, this is really important that McKee has a junket to Lincoln, uh, to, to Will, whatever it is. Victor. Win, 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 Victor, win, Idaho. Victor. Victor, Idaho. Matt Miller, I mean, you're the kind of guy that sets us up. Waller's out there with some fancy fly rod catching trout with Ellen Zender of Morgan Stanley. That's what this comes down to. Yeah, getting ready for Camp Kotak <clears> in <throat> August. I think everyone's watching uh, very closely to see how deep this recession is going to be. It's not a question of if a recession, but when and what kind. And as Lisa pointed out, um, we're, we're seeing a lot of forecasts for maybe a quick and shallow recession. The question is, um, can we be that optimistic? And before we get to the data, Lisa, what's remarkable to me through this week, and again, Lisa Bramlitz and I tonight will be on Wall Street. We're really looking forward to that. Lisa, it's amazing how the equity market is disassociated with all these global and domestic stories in currencies, in bonds, in commodities. You know, right now, the currency market is the market of stress. It is where you see people really express their concern. It is in the dollar strength that we saw yesterday, although e really easing off after we saw <clears throat> from Chris Waller and the Fed's Jim Bullard basically pushing back on, against a 100 basis point rate hike yesterday, which actually calmed markets. But right now, what we're looking at are markets that don't know where to go and stocks are really highlighting that right now let's get to the data right now get matt miller in for john farrow uh this morning uh, at least i'm going to focus on currency dxy over 108 is really the weak statistic here of a strong dollar against euro near parity 1.00 at 38 and yen resiliently weak 138 uh, 76 lisa i'm looking at em as well yeah and that's really on the heels of the dollar strength which is the story of the week perhaps we're seeing a little bit of an easy today, but throughout the week, a rip-roaring rally and just this conviction trade that we're hearing from so many investors. Today, we do get those slew of bank earnings continuing with Citigroup coming out around 8 a.m. expected and Wells Fargo at 7 a.m. These are going to be fascinating, not just for the respective banks and their turnaround uh, plans, but also about the macro economy. Wells Fargo in particular with mortgages, the housing market, Citigroup with the consumer, both of them with a key into what corporations are thinking in terms 
terms of expansion plans. Also, today we do get a slew of economic data. We were just talking, Matt mentioned those retail sales that we get at 8.30 a.m. for the month of June. How much do we see an ongoing retraction in spending, particularly on an inflation-adjusted basis, even as uh, spending on gasoline increases? But University uh, of Michigan consumer sentiment data at 10 a.m. may be one of the key factors, especially their expectations of consumers for inflation over the next five to 10 years. We know that was a key data point for uh, Fed Chair Jay Powell the last time that they actually went 75 basis points. Do we see an ongoing surprise there? <clears throat> and today, there is a slew of Fed speak. It is the last slew of Fed speak before a blackout period that starts next week ahead of their meeting on uh, J July 27th. Raphael Bostic of the Atlanta Fed, James Bullard, and Mary Daly all lining up. What do they say? Do they continue to yeah, knock down the 100 basis point rate hike as they did yesterday, trying to come in a little bit more conservative while again also highlighting their aggressive fight against inflation? Lisa, I'm glad you brought this up. And what I, I think we need to stop here with all the work that Michael McKee's done with James Bullard of the St. Louis Fed. Lisa, Bullard's effort, I'm going to say four or five years ago, to codify the phrase regime change literally will go down in Fed history with what we've put up with in the last year. Yeah, and he has been out front in terms of being more aggressive with the Fed, which is the reason why it was so interesting yesterday when he pushed back against 100 basis point rate hike, <clears throat> really yeah. reiterating the 75 basis points. I mean, it's all parsing these specific uh, basis points. It doesn't matter in the short run, but longer term, it shows where their mind is at in terms of fighting inflation. Chris Morangi joins us right now, co-CIO at Cabelli Funds, and we do this with a broader sweep of Lisa and I getting to the evening and Wall Street Week. Chris Morangi, I want you to help us frame your investment thesis, the courage right now to invest for 2024. How do you do that? How do you develop a two or even three year perspective? Well, thanks, Tom. Yeah, that's exactly what we're looking at. We're trying to look out three to five years. What are the good industries? What are the good companies in those industries? How bad is bad? Can the companies that we're looking at make it through whatever comes in the next 18 months? Uh, so, you know, when you look at it that way, we're pretty calm. Um, you know, we think, as Jamie uh, Diamond pointed out yesterday, economy is going to be much bigger than it is today. And five, 10 years, a uh, lot of uncertainty, a lot of balls in the air now. We're not going to get them all right, but we try to pick, uh, we try to do the best we yeah, can and pick the best companies. Lisa, my research comment yesterday was from David George at Baird, who really leaned in and said, would everybody calm down about the hurricane that's out there? This is on J.P. Morgan, of course. George just simply saying, lose the hurricane. Well, and that seems to be actually what J.P. Morgan's Jamie Dimon was saying, too. There might be a hurricane. We are expecting recession. But right now, things look pretty good. But, Chris, you know, you talk pretty constructively, and yet you talk about the six I's late last year. Inflation, interest rates, infrastructure, income taxes, and international relations, and infection. And today, you add inversion or implosion. That doesn't sound very very optimistic. How do you dovetail the pessimism into your longer term optimism? Yeah, there's no question that we're going to we've got some volatility um, and we're watching all the same things everybody else is. You know, it's it, obviously Wall Street's on its keister. Main Street seems to be doing a little bit better, although obviously some signs of stress and um, those we're going to be watching carefully. The same data that uh, you mentioned earlier. Um, and it wouldn't surprise me that we you know, see a recession um, very soon. I think it's probably shallow. Probably a little lengthier, though, than uh, a lot of people hope. What about the infrastructure uh, and the income taxes? I mean, we have a lot to do on the former, and we pay way too much in the latter. That's not going to change. No, and, you know, obviously news this morning uh, that the, uh, the most powerful Joe in Washington, Joe Manchin, uh, seems to have quashed uh, any effort to get a, a Build Back Better bill done uh, this term. Um, so, you know, that's kind of delayed. I think one of the I don't know if you call it pleasant surprises, but one of the things I was surprised about over the last couple of years has been that we haven't seen movement on on taxes. That's something that we need to get in order uh, probably, you know, in the next term. Um, but obviously, we've got some near term issues to deal with. On rates, Chris, everyone's talking about 75 versus 100 and what we're going to see the following meeting. But I think if you step back and look at the bigger picture, it's more important, especially if you see the framework coming back down into 2023. Is that how you see it? Yeah, I think that's right. Um, you know, I, I share Bill Ackman's perspective that we probably need to get after this as quickly and aggressively as possible. Um, maybe that means 100 at the next meeting. Uh, but, you know, it's, at some point that gives the Fed All the right. ability to cut and to stimulate again.
Chris, we're doing Wall Street Week tonight. Can we go Mario Gabelli on you? Can you give me your single best idea after we go to the elves? Absolutely. And it's the same one that I've had for the last several months, and that's Liberty Braves. I don't want to talk about my New York Yankees this morning. I want to talk about a public company, an ability to own one of 30 uh, Major League Baseball teams, one that happens to be doing pretty well, um, but you know, controlled by the John Malone Liberty Media empire and um, likely to be spun off and sold in the next 18 months. It's trading at 25, which implies a billion and a half value for the team. This team's going for closer to three billion, probably. There you go. Chris Moranga here on Wall Street Week. Thank you so much, Chris, with Gabelli Funds, of course. Lisa, you know, I think this is a lot of fun here and that in this cacophony and all the worry and particularly across assets that we've seen this week, the equity guys, you know what? They're focused out two, three, four years, each with a different view. Yeah, although definitely the short term is getting darker and that seems to be from the pivot that the Fed is going to have to be more aggressive. And we heard that from Margie Patel, who has been really constructive and is actually rethinking that. <laughs> I do wonder, though, when you talk about sports teams. That has become an asset class in itself, and a lot of investors have been plowing into that for a haven trade. So, kind of interesting, especially if you want to invest in your triple leverage tot. Deep, deep conference call yesterday with Julie Norman over at the University of College of London. She was in tears over what the Orioles are doing uh, right now. They're just killing it. I mean, there's no other way to put it. Matt Miller, very quickly here. Last night, I saw a Hummer H3 on Fifth Avenue as well. It's the our worst Hummer to have. Are big cars still selling? Big cars. I mean, look at the new Hummer from GMC, the electric Hummer that costs, I don't know, somewhere way north of $100,000. Yeah, it's gigantic. The H3 <clears throat> is the most embarrassing Hummer to own of all Hummers. Why? Right. So it's just, uh, it, it marked the end of that brand, but now it's reborn in the biggest car of well, all time. That's where Pharaoh's this weekend. He's test driving the new EV Hummer, I think, on some excursion up north, halfway to Tupper Lake. You are with us Friday here. Lisa Abramowitz and I will really be working through the day to bring you the view into July, into that critical Fed meeting, July 27th. Our Anne Marie Horton in Jetta with the president leaving for Jetta on that historic flight near the 8.30 mark. New York time. Please stay with us. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Ritika Gupta. President Biden heads to Saudi Arabia today on a crucial mission. He wants the Saudis to boost oil output to help lower gasoline prices. But Bloomberg's learned that after his meeting with Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, he'll leave the region with no public announcements on oil supply. The U.S. and Saudi governments have been discussing energy markets. Talks will continue regarding output from the members of the OPEC Plus cartel. In Bethlehem, President Biden sought to revive ties with Palestinian Authority. He met with President Mahmoud Abbas and unveiled a $316 million aid package. Donald Trump cut off most U.S. government ties with the Palestinian Authority after a series of disputes. And in the U.K., the race to succeed Boris Johnson as Conservative Party leader and Prime Minister goes on TV today. The five remaining candidates will face off in a televised debate. Former Chancellor Rishi Sunak and Trade Minister Penny Morden pulled ahead of their rivals. In the second round of voting Thursday, the next ballot is Monday. China's economy grew at the slowest pace since it was hit by the coronavirus two years ago. GDP rose a less than expected four-tenths of one percent in the second quarter. That underlines the impact the strict COVID-0 policy has had. Beijing is now likely to miss its goal of about 5.5 percent growth for the full year by a wide margin. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. never been quiet about talking about human rights. I'm going to Saudi Arabia, though, is much broader is to promote U.S. interest. I think we have an opportunity to uh, reassert what I think we've made a mistake of walking away from, our influence in the Middle East. The President of the United States before a most historic flight for those of us who remember 1967 and on and frankly 
for our elders who remember 1948. This is an extraordinary moment of Israel-Palestine and then on to the shores of the Red Sea. Our modern image of presidents in Saudi Arabia is maybe President Trump with el-Sisi of Egypt. In King Solomon in the orb, where they put their hands out and touch the orb, not touching the orb. She is in Jeddah. Amory Horton uh, joins us now, our Bloomberg Washington uh, correspondent. Amory, I'm going to guess that with President Biden, there's going to be no touching of the orb for a photo opportunity. I don't think there's going to be an orb. I don't think there's a very traditional uh, Saudi sword dance that if anyone who's come to the kingdom has either witnessed or been a part of, what potentially we could see is the president is going, going to first meet his counterpart, as the White House would like to say, King Salman. And then he's having a working session, his team and the crown prince, Mohammed bin Salman. So potentially, by the time we get the images, everyone might be sitting at a table. So they might be able to avoid the image which they don't want on the front page of newspapers tomorrow morning, which is a handshake or something chummy with President Biden and crown prince Mohammed bin Salman. And marie we understand that this is a geopolitical strategy and support trip. That that's the way that President Biden has framed it. We are the hoping for some sort of outcome when it comes to the production and, and the drilling of oil from Saudi Arabia. We understand from your reporting they are not going to come out with a statement on that following the meeting. However, what does Saudi Arabia want in return? So I think for Saudi Arabia, the president of the United States coming really is important for Mohammed bin Salman in the sense that it really legitimizes him. He cannot have the president of the United States saying he wants to make his government a pariah or say there's no redeeming qualities about the current government, that he would not be dealing directly with President Biden. So this really legitimizes him, especially to a population that is incredibly young here in Saudi. And also, very honestly, Saudis travel to America. Many Saudis, hundreds, they all go to the United States to study. This is an incredibly important moment for him as he changes a lot uh, socially in the kingdom. And also now he has the president of the United States there having a meeting with him. It legitimizes him as a Saudi leader. And the president has keep continuously saying he's meeting with the leadership of Saudi Arabia. So it's a big coup for him, not just here, but also globally. Well, but Anne-Marie, this really goes to the question that we were asking uh, earlier in the week. Is the, is the juice worth the squeeze? If Saudi Arabia clearly is getting quite a benefit in terms of the recognition from the U.S. president, what is the U.S. getting in return if we're not going to hear a statement on oil and gas when it's unclear whether the, uh, Saudi Arabia has the capacity to even produce all that much more? What benefit does the U.S. emerge mm. from? So a few things on oil and gas. I've been to many OPEC meetings in the past when President Trump would tweet, the cartel needs to pump more. And not in those moments would the cartel ever act. These things take weeks of engagement, and then the entire group would have to sign off on it. And what we do know is that there's been engagement for months, and there continues to be with U.S. government officials and Saudi officials. So what I would say is we should look ahead to the next OPEC meeting. Right now, they're under a strict deal, and potentially there could be more oil coming to the market. Now, potentially the kingdom is not going to be the sole provider that can fix Biden's issue mm. of a little bit under now, $5 a gallon gasoline at home. But you cannot fix the oil oil market without Saudi Arabia. And there are tons of questions about how much spare capacity they have and if they hit their limit, how long they could go for. We should note that the Saudis have never vowed to hit something and then not do it. They really pride themselves on being able to hit all their targets, especially Aramco. It, it does seem like the president is really wasting a lot of political capital here, even if there's no orb. America still sees him as going to Saudi Arabia to figuratively kiss the ring of uh, a murderer who, uh, uh, at least according to intelligence sources here, approved the dismemberment of a journalist. Why risk that when um, it seems like he could get more production out of Texas and Oklahoma were he to change his policy towards U.S. producers? Well, this is why this trip is politically very difficult for the president. It is a very fine line he has to walk. You've laid it all out there, Matt, the reason why Americans don't want to see him coming to the kingdom. And the president himself has been incredibly tough on Mohammed bin Salman when it came to on the campaign trail, even when they went into the administration. But the administration now sees, especially after the Russian invasion of Ukraine, that they need to make sure they're shoring up their allies right now. And while, yes, you can potentially get more production um, from around the world, 
Saudi Arabia is the natural swing producer. It's going to be very difficult to fix an oil market without having the kingdom on board. We should also note, before the president flies in this morning, uh, this afternoon, he did get one uh, win that for years people have been trying to do, which is to make sure you can open up the Saudi airspace for all flights, including any flight coming out of Israel. Right now, that's only possible for flights out of Tel Aviv going to either the Emir Emirates or to Bahrain. Emery Horton, thank you so much for the president uh, landing in Jeddah here this afternoon, late this afternoon, uh, Saudi time, seven hours ahead of where we are here uh, in New York. I need to get back to the markets on a Friday. What you need to know with the bank earnings coming up, an equity lift, futures up 10, Dow futures up 97. The VIX, I haven't even looked for the week, but pretty much unched here, 26.39, certainly constructive away from the stress of a 30 level as well. Lisa, there's the big change. We haven't mentioned it this morning. We're remiss. The curve inversion is extraordinary. It is extraordinary, especially because it's the deepest and longest going back uh, years and years to beyond the crisis that we saw uh, in 2008 and right before that. So if we're looking at the deepest inversion since 2007, what does this mean in terms of how it's affecting the Fed's uh, rhetoric, especially because they don't want to see this? They don't want to see a deep curve inversion for a long time, which is possibly why they pivoted yesterday. Uh, no question about that. Uh, right now, for those of you on radio, the images of the American flag, the Palestinian flag, as well as the president uh, meets with Mr. Abbas and makes uh, comments is, uh, well, it is a very busy schedule for the president here with Israel yesterday and now Palestine and the delicacies of the Levant and then on down south. <clears throat> I think it's a good 700 miles to Jeddah. Jeddah is not Riyadh. For those of you who haven't done Saudi 101, it is their commercial port. It is one of the largest ports in the world on the Red Sea. And uh, he will jet in there, TVL to Jeddah here, a really historic flight. There's no question about that. Dollar strength, dollar resilient this morning. What am I watching? Well, there's any number of significant moments in emerging markets uh, as well. All in all, I would say the euro on parity watch 1.0040. Next week, the ECB. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg. Surveillance, Matthew Miller in for Jonathan Farrow. John's test driving the new Hummer EV this weekend. So he is on a tour north, which is a good and beautiful uh, thing. We're getting you ready for the weekend. What an eventful week it has been with the announcement that Lisa and I will do Wall Street Week tonight. We're really looking forward uh, to that with some good guests, including Lori Calvacina to recalibrate on equities as well. Futures up 10, Dow futures up uh, 100, 210 spread. That's the story this week. Inversion in play, negative 19 basis points for those in uh, the bond space as well. We have an eventful half hour, to say uh, the least. Two housekeeping notes. Moments ago, Damien Sassauer, our EMX, has just published a note on the carnage this week in Jerome Powell's emerging markets. And the basic idea here is with bond flows out, price down, five years of EM profitability wiped out. We thank Lawrence McDonald for attendance yesterday. Uh, he was just uh, b brilliant. Right now, and Lisa, do we agree we've ignored China this week? I think you and I can agree on that, right? We've talked about it as a peripheral story. Yeah. Is it more central than perhaps we've played it? <laughs> yeah, well, I would say so. And to help us out and give you a brief right now, again, in a busy half hour, Enda Curran joins our chief Asia economics uh, correspondent. And uh, what was the surprise here? I know it's always squishy with China data and such. But what was the distinctive surprise moving into a Saturday morning? The size of the hole left in China's economy by the big lockdowns in April and May, Tom. So the second quarter growth came in around 0.4% much below expectations and reinforcing the idea that China now cannot possibly achieve its 5.5% growth target this year. We had a lot of other numbers today as well, just to go over some of them. Retail sales right. came in at 3 Retail sales came in at 3.1% for June. That would suggest on a headline basis the consumers are covering, but when you take out the inflation effect, consumer rebound was actually quite soft. And 
even though unemployment fell, youth unemployment increased and it hit a record of right. almost twenty of almost twenty percent. So the data says China's recovery has a long way to go. And I once sat at literally, I'm kidding you not, folks, at a Starbucks in the French Quarter of Shanghai, and a very very young American economist said to me simply, "There is no other mandate than to keep people employed." At what risk is Beijing in this historic slowdown where they can't keep people employed? Well, job creation is priority number one for the party. Tom, as we all know, the officials routinely come out and make the point that they've got to create jobs for people. Now, we did see the survey jobless rate fall back to 5% today. That does indicate that jobs are coming back on stream. But as I mentioned to you, the problem seems to be youth unemployment, 16 to 24-year-olds. I think there's about 10 million graduates coming onto the scene this year alone to get new jobs. That unemployment rate for that sector rose to 19.3%. There's a lot of discontent among the younger people about you know, new, what opportunities there are for them now in China. Is the growth story starting to fade? Yeah. The, crackdown on, the crackdown on the tech sector, the slowdown in real estate, it's not just all zero COVID, but it's all coming together and it is squeezing jobs for young people. And uh, the surprise was the downside read that we got from the GDP print, but it was also that it was reflected as such in the official numbers. What is the likely policy implication that officials themselves are recognizing weakness that private sector and analysts have been talking about for months? I think it does, it has to underscore, Lisa, that more government support will be coming. now. Interestingly, today, the central bank opted against putting extra liquidity into the financial system because they're saying there's enough liquidity there. And there is a view that China doesn't need lower interest rates. That's not the tonic to solve what its problems are. So what's probably going to come will be more government spending, especially on infrastructure projects. And most likely, maybe we'll see a lot of green energy and alternative energy projects getting off the ground as well. We're already seeing stories of local governments ramping up their borrowing, spending being accelerated, and clearly that's where the target is. So it'll be a mix of extra spending, tax breaks for small and medium-sized companies, mostly on the fiscal side, with the central bank, I think, playing a support role. But more support will be coming, no doubt. To me, and uh, the biggest shock um, in this story is something Lisa was pointing out earlier. It's just the transparency. I can't believe that they're telling us the actual figures or what looks like at least a huge miss um, from their forecast. Why? Well, there are those who say, Matt, that these figures in themselves are already maybe stretching things a bit too far. They already look like they're a little bit too optimistic. But ultimately, you know, nobody can deny the trend of, of direction for China's economy in the first half of the year. It wasn't just Shanghai that was locked down. There were dozens of other cities that were locked down. There were, were restrictions all around the country. It impacted industrial production, it impacted ports, it impacted logistics, and above all, it impacted consumers. And then don't forget the real estate side, the real estate side of things, by the way, the numbers that came out for that today were also quite negative, showing another, another slide in prices and property investment. That makes up about 20% of the economy. So. As I say, there's always scrutiny and skepticism of China's data, but the net net numbers today being, yeah. you know, broadly, speak, broadly speaking, negative. I mean, I don't think anybody co could have really covered that up. Right. And uh, thanks for the coverage through the Friday evening in Hong Kong and occurring on China. Claudia Sam has been listening on in the foreign moment of Jerome Powell, central banker to the world. She's founder of Sam uh, Consulting, and most importantly, Claudia Sam of the Sam Rule. What an oddity of recession gloom into a fully employed America. Let's get this phrase. It was never in the Michigan textbooks. Can you have a recession in a fully employed economy? At this point, we can have anything. I mean, nothing would surprise me. It, it is absolutely unusual to have a recession. And, like to see activity, to see GDP contracting for two, two quarters straight and at the same time have low unemployment and massive job gains. So we might have what I've heard called a jobful recession. Yeah. This is not usual. You grew up in the crucible, academically grew up in the crucible of inflation study. Michigan is the franchise for studying folks, the slicing and dicing. Should our bankers be looking at top line inflation or the trimmed inflation or the core inflation or the SOM inflation? 
Well, so monetary policymakers ought to be looking at every piece of inflation, both the top line stripping out of food and energy and also the components. Like we really need to understand what's driving this to understand where it's going. Now, one thing that I have heard from Jerome Powell that is disconcerting is the idea that top line, including these massive energy swings, will help guide their policy. That's problematic uh, because we know food and energy whips all around. And frankly, the Fed, those are supply problems. They can't do anything about that. So it's that is hard to hear. Um, but it is true. We've had big energy increases. And what they are concerned about is that consumers look at that and they start expecting more inflation. They change their behavior and they cause more inflation. And that would be That'd be bad. Well, and Claudia, this is the reason why uh, the Fed is between a rock and a hard place. They don't want to cause recession, but they also don't want to allow those inflation expectations to become entrenched. You have basically argued that the Fed should do what it needs to do to take down inflation. Other supply side issues are not their issue, though. It really is Congress and what happens in Washington. And as a result, the Fed shouldn't go too far. At this point, given the lack of action in Congress, what is too far? How far should the Fed eventually go just expecting that we're not going to get anything in terms of legislation in a split Congress. Yeah, well, we learned last night that Senator Joe Manchin is walking away from any kind of energy legislation. And that's that means the Fed is on its own. The administration has floated nothing that will get gas prices down. So now it's up to the Fed that inflation will be transitory one way or the other. The Fed will guarantee that. That's not what we're going to want. They're going to the Fed will try their hardest to avoid a recession. But what they are doing right now, the full effect of it comes next year. And that's nobody knows what's coming next year. We got to have some things in the world uh, go our way. And that has not been the case for two and a half years. So it's not a pretty picture. And frankly, as Congress walks away, it's getting worse. Claudia, the timing seems really bad here because the Fed is going all out, guns a-blazing. We're talking about a full percentage point increase right at a time when it looks like inflation really has peaked. I mean, if you look at the Bloomberg commodity indexes on the ags, on the metals, on the oils, they're all coming down markedly. Um, do you think we're going to see inflation? Uh, where do you think we're going to see inflation at the end of the year? And is the Fed still going to be headed up towards four? This was part of the reason that the CPI print this this week was so crushing. Like the Fed is not going to stop until they see inflation, published inflation from the Bureau of Labor Statistics coming down in a meaningful way. Right. We've been head faked by supply chains getting better and then Putin shows up and then they get worse again or China shuts down and they get worse again. So the Fed needs to see it. Yeah. And we haven't seen it. Right, in Claudia, data. into the weekend, what's your so what to the five or six deciles of America flat on their black back with massive negative real wage growth? I mean, what, what, how, how do we deal with that? I've never seen an integrand like that, the area below the zero line. Yeah, well, we got to get inflation down, right? The, the labor market is strong. People are, they're getting jobs. They're getting paychecks. We've seen wage raises a little bit less recently. You got to get inflation down. You got to get the purchasing power. Right now, households have a lot of them have some money on the side, right, from the relief packages and the labor market that's been strong. Yeah. So that is helping with spending, but that can only go on so long. And income is the best predictor of spending. Spending is the biggest part of activity of yeah. GDP. That's, you know. Okay, Claudia, thank you so much for the Friday brief. Claudia Sam getting us here into the weekend. Her acclaimed Sam rule uh, as well. Please stay with us. Future is a little green, up eight. This is Bloomberg. With the first word news, I'm Ritika Gupta. Senator Joe Manchin has delivered a huge blow to President Biden's ambitious economic agenda. Manchin, a Democrat, told party leaders he would not support new spending on climate measures or tax increases. Manchin says he will back proposals on health care and drug prices. 
The European Union is falling behind on its high-profile promises to deliver a substantial aid package to Ukraine. Almost two months ago, EC President Ursula von der Leyen proposed spending $9 billion in loans, but only a fraction of that has been agreed on so far. The EU is facing severe economic pain from inflation and a possible cutoff of Russian gas. In Italy, Prime Minister Mario Draghi has less than a week to forge some difficult compromises with the populists in his government. Draghi's decision to offer his resignation plunged the country into a paralyzing political crisis. He said he could no longer trust the parties that backed his national unity government. A confidence vote may be held next week. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Tape, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Richard Gupta. This is Bloomberg. Breaking news right now on American banking, and this is the bank people talk less of. We're going to do a clinic right now on a troubled Wells Fargo. They have released earnings with a greater shock than what we saw from J.P. Morgan yesterday and a much greater shock than wealth manager, accumulator of assets, Fortress Gorman, over at Morgan Stanley. I heard Matt Miller, Shanali Basic when these headlines came out simply say wow what is the level of miss unfair question but let's go there right now no, what's is, the level of it miss it is a significant miss because net interest income is <clears throat> below 1 billion uh, 1 billion dollars the reason this is such a problem for Wells Fargo is interest rates are rising they have a double edged sword here because not <clears throat> only is net right. interest income under pressure the provisions for credit losses are also higher than expected yes. and they expect credit losses to keep increasing from these levels on october of 2016, Mr. Stumpf was shown the door. From where I sit, this is the least covered of the major banks. It's a mystery. They're in San Francisco. Mr. Scharf does the New York uh, commute as well. But here's the reality. This is the great shink shrinking bank. I've got J.P. Morgan over four years, 115 gazillion out to 128 gazillion. That's diamond-like growth. Mm -hmm. At the same time, Wells Fargo is shrinking from 86 to 73. Yeah. In Scharf's shrinkage plan, how does this lousy report fit in? Well, think about it this way. They're still under that asset cap, but even beyond that, you have Charlie Scharf, who is a Jamie Dimon protege. And so for him to shrink this bank to greatness mm -hmm. is a different type of strategy <clears throat> in an era where their, <laughs> their costs you are know, Lisa, still exorbitant, <clears throat> higher than Wall Street expects, Tom. Uh, and that yeah. is going to be costly for him to keep shrinking. And, and Lisa, what's great about this with Tom Michaud coming up and all of Middle, Middlebury, it's like it's like Shanali there encapsulating my hockey career of shrinking myself to greatness. I mean, <laughs> I mean, you can't, at least that's not a business plan. I'm sorry. Well, it becomes a very difficult one in a terrain where they're both are difficult uh, growth opportunities and the existing business is challenged. Shanali, how much are these weak results a story of Wells Fargo and how much are they a macroeconomic concern about what's ahead? We knew that Wells Fargo would be more exposed to the macro story because they're also the biggest home lender of all of the big banks. Jamie Dimon yesterday was saying that more banks should probably get out of the business in a bigger way. So when they're that exposed, not just to mortgages, yeah. but also the consumer picture, where provisions are starting to increase further and credit losses are starting to tick okay, higher, well, Wells is exposed. This headline just coming out, and you know, this is where we're really getting into the shocks of this rate volatility. $107 million write down due to market spread widening. Translate. So this is what we were talking about yesterday, being exposed to these <clears throat> wild price swings in the market. Uh, you were talking about value. You made fun of me, Tom, when I said value yeah. at risk was going to be a problem here. You're not. That's a, a VAR line. 
Yes. And yes, you know, like the old days. Somebody lost money. And this is not even a very big investment bank compared to the others. And so remember, exactly. you're seeing consumer issues and you're okay. starting to see cracks in the well, corporate and buy side clients. Dive into it and we'll do Citigroup here with us, Shanali Bassick here later in the morning. Right now, this is a great joy. Thomas Michaud is CEO of Keith Briette and Woods, KBW. It's a steeple company, but far more, he is our great voice on the state of American banking. He's not a security analyst. He's actually out there trying to do business. Thomas showed where is the American banking industry, and for that matter, for Wells Fargo in 36 months? I think we've got a pause there. I don't know, Lisa, I thought my hearing went there. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, there he is. There he is, yes, Thomas showed. Continue, um, Tom. Yes, sure. So Wells Fargo, I think, is, is a unique situation unto itself because of the transition there. And, and I've been listening to the results just as they've just been coming out, and I haven't had a chance to dig into them. However, I think this core, it depends who you are, Tom, in my opinion, what type of bank you are and what your business mix is. Because the big money center banks, essentially parts of their business are already in recession. And recession is the central point to everything in the banking industry, because it's gonna drive what happens to revenues and then what happens to credit. So uh, the investment banks right now are showing declining revenues. Uh, revenues were down 11% from Morgan Stanley. We think anyone, any bank with a big investment banking business is gonna have a tough run on revenues. At the same time, don't forget what the core regional banks are doing. We've had two regional banks report so far. First Republic's revenues were up 22% year over year, while Morgan Stanley's were down 11. Washington Federal, which reported yesterday, was up 17%, while JP Morgan's revenues were flat. So, and, and so I think it depends what your business mix is. And then we should also have a conversation about credit. All right. So, Tom, before we get there, what's the leading indicator here, the Wall Street or the Main Street? I, I personally think the Main Street, because there's a there's a, a smaller number of uh, investment banks for the industry, the big investment banks, the, the write downs that you mentioned earlier, 100 uh, percent. That's that's a real issue, which is credit spreads have widened out and as credit spread. And I think that's been already part of the story of this quarter, which is the marks on a lot of these assets. These are not the assets that regional banks own. These are these are the assets that the big banks own. So I think their dilemma and their challenges are different. And it's also going to be quite stark because last year was such an incredible year. Well, so the comparisons are, are dramatic. Don't forget that JP Morgan had a difficult quarter and earned 16 on equity. Morgan Stanley had a difficult quarter and earned 15 on equity. So I think you have to remember the underlying basis of the companies but, is still pretty good. Sure, Tom, we're not looking at a meltdown in the financial sector. There is a question, though, as Larry McDonald said, at what point do markets overtake the economy? Do they take overtake the narrative uh, in the broader world? How much are we looking at a difficulty of companies raising money? And I speak to you as someone who has a bird's eye view into investment yes. banking activity through KBW. I think the world has changed, and I think every day that goes by, it's changing more. I think your, I, my own personal opinion about the inevitability of a recession continues to grow, and I, and I, and and there are actually pockets of business that feel like they're already there. If you're in the equity, the equity capital markets have essentially ceased. These businesses are down, ceased operations. They're down 70, 80 percent. So if if that already feels like a recession. If you're in the mortgage origination business, uh, that is going to feel like a recession. We're looking for originations to be down 41%. So, so I think that this is gonna be somewhat of a rolling uh, experience. The question is really, is it a crisis? I, I, think it's, I think it's inevitable that we're gonna have a technical recession. The question is, is it a mild recession or a crisis? As of now, my instincts are not a crisis. But, but I think it's inevitable that this economy is slowing and, and I'm watching forecasts and I'm watching real GDP 
already send these signals. I, I wonder how the housing market plays into that, Tom, especially because we're talking about Wells Fargo, but also because I've seen the terms mark to market used in um, bank earnings reports the last couple of days, Morgan Stanley and JP Morgan. Fortunately, consumers don't have to do that, but the consumer really stretched to get the most unaffordable houses um, that they could over the last few quarters. And if we go into a recession, is that a problem for these banks? I think the underwriting has been extraordinarily sound. I mean, first of all, when when non-performers go up, which they will, the surprise shouldn't be that they've gone up. The surprise should be that they were zero for so long. Um, it's remarkable how pristine, this is the most pristine I've seen the ratios in my yeah. career. So it's inevitable that it's going to right. go up. But where's the real big risk? I, I, I'll say two quick points. The shadow banking industry exploded in size during zero interest rate policy. So I think it's going to be very, very keen to watch what happens in the shadow banking industry. There's a right. lot of credit. It's, it's four times the size of the banking industry, we think. Right. Okay? That's number one. Number two is the majority of Dodd-Frank was really good. And, and so these banks have more capital, more liquidity. They right. may have higher non-performers. But I, I think they're going to be able to churn through it, the average bank. Right. Uh, Tom, Michelle, Jamie on Park Avenue just emailed in and said, can Michelle talk about a real bank? So let's do that right now, Tom, Michelle. The Keith Briette honor roll, in honor of Dave Barry, are the banks out there that are getting it done. And one of them is First National Bank of Long Island. What can James Diamond, what can Brian Moynihan, what can Mr. Scharf, what can they learn from the operation that you've awarded of the First National Bank of Long Island? Well, companies like uh, uh, that bank, okay, uh, keep it very, very simple. Um, and, uh, and, and, they, and they tend to, to take a lot of collateral and they don't require a lot of market activity to generate revenue. They're very spread-based. Um, now, they have challenges because technology is impacting yeah. their business and need to afford it. But I think the key, the key part about that is we just went through a very long period of time of zero interest rates. Spread lending was not built to really excel when interest rates were zero. We, it, it, as long as we don't get into a crisis, we get a higher right. rate environment, it's actually going to be okay for a typical regional Tom, bank. I got 30 seconds. How do they survive digital banking? How does every other bank out there, the heritage of KBW, how do they survive my mobile cell phone and my Chase account? They better get it. They better get on the trend because customer usage is here. COVID accelerated uh, in five months during COVID, right. we did about four years of adoption. They better get on board or they will become dinosaurs, and we're seeing them working hard to do it. But there probably will be more consolidation okay. uh, for that reason. Thanks for the brief. Been too long. Thomas showed of KBW there with Wells Fargo reporting. Lisa, you know, each of these banks is different, and, and I have been remiss at this. I've underreported Wells Fargo uh, for years, and now with mortgage rates moving from 3.22, I think it is on a moving average basis, out to near 6%. I'm sorry, Lisa, that's a big deal. Well, we're looking at a bank that is much more exposed to the consumer, and it is saying that the consumer, while still maybe in a good spot, is really uh, losing momentum, and that is the story. We will have to see. Matt Miller in for John Farrow with Lisa Abramowitz, the president on his way to Jeddah here in about an hour and a half with Anne-Marie Hordern in Jeddah. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg Futures Up 10. said they're going to do whatever they need to do for inflation. Right now, the market is giving the Fed basically a green light to go by 100 basis point at the July meetings. What I'm concerned about is the Fed focusing so much on the headline inflation. They're losing track of an economy which is losing momentum. When risk assets are moving this fast, the risk assets take over economic data. The market's starting to price in a much higher probability of a recession. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. 
Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Bramitz, and Tom Keen. Bloomberg Surveillance, a very eventful Friday. The president traveling in the Middle East, a most historic moment here in 90 minutes. Also a most historic moment, Matthew Miller in for John Farrell, and we welcome him uh, this morning. We've been talking Hummers in the new EV Hummer that I guess Mr. Farrell is looking at. Lisa, the news flow is extraordinary. Let me cut to the chase. Pick it, Lisa. What is your story on this Friday? On this Friday, it's going to be retail sales in the University of Michigan. Also, what the Fed officials have to say. The bank earnings are interesting, but Wells Fargo is not J.P. Morgan. It is not the clear-cut bellwether, at least as perceived by the market, as others are. And right now, the market is shrugging off what could be viewed as a fairly big miss, particularly when it comes to net interest income. Everything she said, folks, is accurate, particularly retail sales at 830, but far more interesting to global ones. Wall Street is what's occurred this week is curve inversion, 19 basis points. And Lisa, I'm, I've been out, I've been out front on this, and maybe I'm wrong, but I'm maybe overemphasizing the emerging market decay we observe. It is another uh, symptom of the dollar strength. It is another roll, rock knock-on effect that is going to cause some serious issues, and we're seeing that with our own Damian Sassauer pointing out that in the credit sphere of sovereign debt uh, in these emerging markets, you've seen five years of profit wiped out in just a couple months. And that is what we're seeing. How much and how far can this dollar right. go as the haven bet at a time when there are so many nations feeling the other side and a flip side of pain? You know, it's interesting to see this here, folks. I'm going to fold the data check in here with Dollar Canada out to 131-ish, uh, uh, even with a magnitude of 100 basis points. Shock, and I mean shock this week, without question, the biggest shock of the week. But Matt Miller, to me, the biggest shock of the week, which folds into the German nat gas debate in this autumn, is the heat wave in Europe. They are talking of modeling above 100 degrees Fahrenheit in London uh, this weekend. This goes up to Leeds and over to Shrewsbury as well. Matt Miller, the heat wave across Europe, you've lived it. How's it different than in America? Well, um, I haven't been living in America through a summer for six years, so I'm not sure if we're going to hit the hundreds here. I'm sure in New York City we will. That's a typical uh, temperature for Berlin in August. And the interesting thing to me um, this week has been the euro going down through parity. That's so tightly connected to the gas issues. You've right. spoken well, on this do that. program. Do that right now, Matt. Connect the two. Yeah, as Jordan Rochester has said a couple of times on this program this week, as we ha have those gas concerns, as we get closer to a rationing of gas use in countries like Germany, um, the economy, the economic concerns just skyrocket. And that's why you see the euro yeah. dumping down below a dollar. I mean, I mean, Lisa here, and, and, and folks, the, the, the frenzy on a Friday is a cacophony. That's the word I would use here. At least it's like we're getting hit from all sides. And yet the VIX tells me equities have been resilient. Are we surprised? Uh, some people would say yes. At the same time, if you listen to Jamie Dimon, if you listen to so many surveys, the consumer still is spending. There still is enough strength. The job market is incredibly tight. So we're looking into a storm from a place of relative calm when we look at the economy. Like that. Yeah, and that yeah, yeah. is the conundrum that's causing some of the calm mm, that right. we're seeing in risk assets. Did we see a signal this week, Lisa Bramowitz, from credit, high yield on down to investment grade? No, sanguine. Uh, people not necessarily uh, right. seeing any kind of catastrophe. And how much is this because people are looking for yield and right. not seeing the default cycle in the same way as in the past? We've got retail sales this morning, Matt Miller. I think they're going to be as important, maybe more important, than that 9.1% inflation report. And the shelter attributes of that inflation report really jump-started the persistency of inflation that some are guessing on. Yeah, the, the retail sales number, to me, in conjunction with the bank earnings and, and the color that we get mm. um, from those executives are so key because we heard yesterday from Chris Waller, we heard today from Claudia Sam, um, the sort of hopeful optimism that the U.S. consumer still has some money stuffed away from the stimulus. And yeah. on the other hand, credit card spending is rising. So the question 
for me is how leveraged is this consumer to keep spending? I do just want to bring up, just crossing the terminal, there is a correction and it is a fairly big correction. I want to bring this to you. We talked about net interest income coming below a billion dollars. It is corrected to being uh, $10.92 billion versus an estimate of $10.15 billion, which coheres a little more with what the CEO is talking about, Tom, with respect huge to net correction. interest. Huge correction. This is completely uh, reversing it. They actually beat on net well, interest income, and that is actually helping to support their bottom line, yeah. as Charlie uh, Scharf has been talking about in the uh, in the uh, press release. We're going to have to stop the show right now. This is so important, folks. Bloomberg and the heritage of over a quarter century is when there's a correction. We really don't care who screwed up. We just want to report it to you because of market uh, participants. Tell me in the control room what else Fargo stock is doing here pre-market. I assume it's doing better. We're advantaged with Shanali Basak uh, with us right now as she looks at a mother of all corrections. Shanali, do we have any Still idea where the correction came from? Well, the correction came up on the net interest income line, as you say. It is really important because they need to make money elsewhere. Remember, mortgage we were talking to are down. We had reported also that consumer banking has been doing a little better, marginally better, about 2% better in terms of revenue year over year than expected. So you do see other lines of the consumer business doing better. You have Charlie Scharf saying that loan balances are increasing, mm -hmm. but net income did decline in the second quarter. So it is a mixed bag for Wells Fargo, but they need to earn on net interest income in the face of what they see as higher uh, losses ahead in terms of credit quality. We'll put up here what the stock is doing right now. It was down, I'll call it substantially here, off some grim news and a little less grim it's news still, here. It's still down, which it's is interesting. It's still down, okay. Yeah. It's the credit costs. I mean, th yes. that's the worry right. at the end of the day that, you know, yesterday's numbers don't give you tomorrow's well, success. And so. we heard Thomas showed talk about that, that everything changes as maybe you get to a normal spread business uh, in banking. Futures advance up 12, Dow futures up 119. The VIX 26.21. Very simple in the yield space. You've got inversion. Let's pivot off a 10 year yield at 2.93%, well below 3% uh, level. That curve inversion, 19 basis points, 0.19 percentage points difference, a higher two year yield a lower 10-year uh, yield. I do want to mention Italian spreads. They did widen out off the Draghi. Uh, help me here, Lisa. Is it a resignation or... Well, uh, he we tried don't to resign. Either. He tried to resign, and the president rejected it. And so now they're trying to figure out what's next. But it has been a crisis in Italy, which raises serious <clears throat> concerns for the ECB, which wants to uh, prevent spread yeah. widening for too much, and now has to face the prospect of being accused of political yeah, interference. Okay, so up we went with a wider spread there, and German spread to Italy. Italy take away the German yield is a little bit grimmer than it was a week ago. Dollar resilient on 108.34 on DXY, and sterling 118.40. She has been more than patient, but an important conversation out of the land of the fighting Texas Aggies with G-Squared Private Wealth. Their chief investment officer, Victoria Green, uh, joins us. And Victoria, it's nice to get away and talk to somebody that ag actually knows how important Texas, Texas A&M football uh, used to be. Somebody at that game is going to go, I need to reallocate here. I need to have courage to be in the market. How do you reallocate amid this chaos? Uh, I think you're looking for defense still. I think it's early to chase. Uh, we're not trying to, to buy some of the, the stuff that sold off the hardest. I think that is right now a value trap still. Uh, I think as earnings roll in, you can see they're all mixed at best. Uh, you know, United Health is good. PNC good, Wells Fargo, JP Morgan, uh, Morgan Stanley were kind of more mixed and, and downtrodden. So listen to what these people are saying. A lot of these CEOs are not uber bullish. Uh, they're warning about loan losses on the banking side. So we're playing defense. We're we're looking um, to, to not buy this dip yet. We think it's going to leg down a little bit lower. We think the Fed's going to have to move. You've got a lot of pressures on the consumer. We talk about how consumer spending has stayed relatively stable, but that's because they're borrowing. And if you look what's happening on how much the consumer debt is rising, even though consumers have been spending and travel has been robust, it's not that they're saving. It's not that they're pulling this from cash. They're now adding to their balance sheets and, and adding debt. So something we're definitely watching because we feel like the consumer is very, very stressed right now. And the U.S. economy lives and dies on its consumer. So, Victoria, what does playing defense mean at a time when the Fed is very much in play and bonds have been out of favor for the majority of the year? 
Sure, ultra short, right? Like we would focus on the 90 to 120 day treasury bonds or some sort of ultra short duration. We don't want duration. We don't want credit risk. We want to be boring. I know that's silly, but boring is fantastic right now. So we want cap stocks that are making a lot of money. We're playing defense in health and staples. We're looking for companies with resilient revenue streams. We're looking with companies with a strong dollar that their revenues are more earned in the United States versus multinationals. So like a Ross store or a Costco that is mostly U.S. revenues, so you're going to be hit a little bit less on this dollar because I feel like that's a big headwind for a lot of multinational companies that's being underestimated now because as the world continues to evolve and the U.S. relative to other countries is possibly going to tighten faster and, and raise rates faster, I don't see the dollar pressure easing off. I think versus the euro and the yen, because it's all relative depending on which currency, the dollar is going to be extremely strong for the for the seeable future. Victoria, my good friend Paul Sweeney, a three-decade Wall Street veteran, his number one rule is don't fight the Fed. Um, you point that out as, as one of your convictions right now as well. Is there a point when you change that? Is there a point when you see the Fed um, start to turn over that you do start to go in there? Absolutely. If we have capitulation or the Fed starts to put anything dovish in, you know how we love to look at the meeting minutes and we parse out any tiny chains in vernacular to see and see what they may be thinking. But I would be looking at the data. <clears throat> They're going to hike until something breaks and either the economy is going to break, uh, the, the labor market is going to break or liquidity is going to break. Or last but not least, inflation might finally break. But those are the only four things we're looking at. What's going to give first? We're in this massive tug of war right now. High inflation, tight labor. Mm -hmm. And relative to the amount of hikes they're talking about, the markets absorb them quite well. Right. And the Fed doesn't care if Apple goes down. That's not their job. The Fed only cares about the market if liquidity dries up. So we're looking for all those canaries in the coal mine. But the Fed's going to need a reason to change. It's going to be status quo and hawkish until something changes in the data that makes right. them need to pause. Victoria, i got to leave it there. Victoria Green, thank you so much with G Squared uh, for being with us uh, today. Lisa, I want to scope out here Wells Fargo with a drop down from a 38.80, almost a 39 level, down to middle 37, and we've made about halfway back on Wells Fargo with that net income correction. They still have increased their credit, their provisions for credit losses, and perhaps that's what people are picking up on for a bank that is exposed to the consumer. Uh, they are saying that it, interest income actually was a huge benefit to their business and expects to continue to be given the higher interest rates, which makes sense given where we are in the environment. Going forward, it will be interesting to hear what they have to say about the mortgage business that has uh, definitely lost favor with a lot lot of investment banks, considering the fact that mortgage rates are pretty darn high. Uh, and then also just how much they see the consumer mm. weakening currently versus the, uh, the strength that we hear from others. On the screen right now, what's really of interest is the equity market with a very nice lift. Futures up 13, Dow futures up 128. And for the second, third day in a row or so, we have the larger indices leading the NASDAQ higher. That somehow changes in the afternoon, I would suggest, or at least when we get the market open. But right now, Dow leading SPX, fractionally leading on a percentage basis. A NASDAQ 100. NASDAQ up three-tenths of a percent uh, as well. We are going to continue. Most importantly, we continue to monitor the travels of the President of the United States. In the Levant, he will move south to an historic visit in Jeddah, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, our Anne-Marie Hordern is in Jeddah awaiting the president. Please stay with us again. Futures up 13 on a Friday. This is Bloomberg. I fully support another 75 basis point increase. However, my base case for July depends on incoming data. If that data come in materially stronger than expected, it would make me lean towards a larger hike at the July meeting. One of the best researchers in America, and that would be Vincent Reinhardt, well, who will join us later. And Vincent Reinhardt of the Fed knows well that Christopher Waller is truly one of our great thinkers on economics, the governor of the Federal Reserve now, after his ownership of research at the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis. I want to do a data check here, but I want to dive deeper into Jerome Powell is central banker of the world, and I want to bounce off Lawrence McDonald in his appearance yesterday in the great work of Damien Sassauer. We quote the Dow, we quote the Standard & Poor's 500, we do the curve inversion in that. Focus. 
The five-year yield in Egypt, Lisa Abramowitz, is 16.5%. It's gone from par down to 72 with three days of erosion this week. EM bonds are grim, according to Damien Sassauer. And according to every metric that you look at, not only because of a strong dollar, but because of issues having to do with commodity prices spiking, with a lot of these nations being commodity yeah. importers. And I think of Egypt and how hinged they are to Ukrainian wheat. I mean, if you think about the butterfly effect that is going on globally, it's roiling markets and creating some real distress. As you prepare to get to July 27 in that Fed meeting, indeed the ECB tomorrow, let's remember people like Secretary Terry Yellen, and every other finance type, no doubt talking to the International Monetary Fund into August. Dan Marie Norton knows all this. Our Bloomberg chief Washington correspondent. It's 109 degrees in Riyadh, so she decided she'd go where it's cooler. It's only 100 degrees in Jeddah, so it's a good and strategic move for Anne Marie. What kind of heat will President Biden receive from Mohammed bin Salman? Well, we should also note, Tom, it's very hot in Riyadh, but it's much more humid because we're on the Red Sea here. And it's a great question because the president's going to be coming into a very uh, difficult line to walk when he sets foot in the kingdom. He'll be meeting the king first and then that meeting with Mohammed bin Salman. All eyes are on this meeting. This is really the pivotal moment of the trip. Um, Mohammed bin Salman will likely be very gracious for the administration to come and meet him, especially the president. I'm not sure if he's going to get the same heat that there's been reporting that others in the administration have gotten from Mohammed bin Salman that the, he would do directly to the president. But I think he'll make it pretty clear that I am the individual, I, I am the king's son, and I am running the day-to-day -day operations for my father. So if you need something out of the kingdom, you're going to have to go through me. And Marie, how much are we going to hear about the potential capping of Russian oil prices, considering the fact that a lot of people don't think that the sanctions, as is, have worked of implementing more pain on Russia than the rest of the world? Well, it's a great question, Lisa, because the administration wants to enact this, but really needs a lot of individuals, countries on board with this. Uh, OPEC, Russia is part of OPEC Plus, and they have a strategic relationship when it comes to the energy market with the kingdom. But also, they have to still get all those shippers and insurers involved in this if they were going to have a price cap. But we should note what's actually happening in the market right now is that Russian oil is still leaving Russia just heavily discounted. So a lot is going to India, definitely a lot is going to China, but also a lot is going into the Middle East. A lot of it is going through the port in the United Arab Emirates into the Middle East and then being exported out, depending on whether or not it's going into yeah. gasoline, diesel, jet fuel. So there is already the market working in a sense of a price cap because Russian crude is heavily discounted to those buyers. It's classic because those distillates are going straight back to Europe and straight back to those companies that sanctioned Russian oil initially, and of course Putin is just making a ton of money throughout this whole thing. Emery, back to Saudi Arabia, back to President Biden's trip. Before you were Washington correspondent, you spent a good decade going to OPEC meetings and covering the oil market really closely. Um, are we wrong to be worried about spare capacity? Because it doesn't look like um, a lot of OPEC nations have so much. Is, is that a distinction we should be making, the, the base level they can produce and the spare capacity above that? It's a, it's a great question to be asking and that U.S. should be worried about in the sense that you have all these OPEC countries not even hitting their targets right now when you look at Nigeria or Angola or Libya for that matter. So there's really only two countries that have this spare capacity, which is the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates. And there's lots of question marks about how much spare capacity they do have. When they pumped at will, uh, they were able to do it for about three weeks, and then that was it. So there's a question of what spare capacity do they have and how long, especially with the kingdom, could it last. Right. But the kingdom has always took a lot of pride in itself to making sure they can deliver those barrels on the market. But you have to think that if you have the UAE and the kingdom going full out in the oil market, prices will actually probably rise because they'll realize there's not a lot of spare capacity. So I imagine the conversations is for very much so a gradual increase of barrels to the market. Emory, what is the price of this? What is the military hardware we have to migrate to Riyadh to protect them from the insurgents of Yemen? 
Well, we're not sure exactly yet in terms of what the administration is going to sign off are. We do know that when it comes to the kingdom, there's been uh, a lot more so conversations with the defense ministry as well as our uh, Pentagon and that they definitely want more defensive missiles. And that has been an ask for decades and years. I think what the kingdom, though, is looking more so from this visit is the fact that what it symbolizes to the region, which is that our partners are still here with us in the region and the buck stops with them. The Americans are our strategic partner in the region and they definitely want to send that signal, Riyadh, to Tehran. Emory Horton, thank you so much. We're now an hour, maybe an hour and 10 minutes away from a most historic landing of Air Force One uh, in Jeddah and Anne Marie Horton uh, is there. I look at this lease unfolding all in and it does speak to the regional stability starting with Tunisia here, or I'm going to say two, three uh, weeks ago, not to be the gloom of an Arab Spring, but with yields in Egypt at 16 percent, it certainly speaks of Arab and Levant uh, fragility. Yeah, and actually we're hearing from Janet Yellen getting concerned about some of the flows, the fund flows into emerging markets, cautioning against some of the volatility there because it could become an area of much bigger distress. And you're right to point to Egypt because it is one of the key nodes and one of the key sufferers when it comes to the lack of wheat exports coming from Ukraine. How do we look at that and avoid some sort of social unrest if you do see the prices of the basic staples of the daily lives uh, being right. risen that much. Matt, I want to take 48 seconds here and talk about the gloom we're going to see on Wall Street Internet this week. Uh, we're going to do Wall Street Week tonight, Lisa Bramitz and myself. And you know, Matt, it comes out starting about 3 p.m. Friday, doom and gloom. Here's a single bullet from Douglas Cass, who trades often, sometimes makes money. He goes, I am buying. That's a lonely voice right now, Matt Miller, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely, especially because a lot of people think we're only halfway through this correction. Gary Schilling told me that earlier this week, and Michael Burry has been tweeting it. We'll talk about many different opinions, and tonight again, Lori Calvacina, David Bianco, I believe Professor Summers will darken the door as well. Tonight, Lisa Abramowitz and myself, Wall Street Week. This is Bloomberg. Good morning. Surveillance. Good morning, everyone. John Farrow off today. Matthew Miller in for Mr. Farrow and Lisa Abramowitz here as well. Futures up 14, Dow futures up 149. The VIX 26.11 is a, a, a constructive statistic. Brent crude back above $100 a barrel uh, gets my attention. And other than that, it's stasis. I want to take 12 seconds and note a grim Italian inflation report. It is out at 8% in June back to 1986. But what's stunning in the report is for low earners where they sub subgroup that out, it was 8.3% in the first quarter and 9.8% for low earners in Italy in the second quarter. The uneven burden of inflation is tangible. On individual securities, Lisa Abramos. Yeah. Lisa, what do you have? Tom, I really want to take a look at some of the bank earnings. We did get uh, earnings from Wells Fargo showing that they did have a pretty much in-line interest income, which was the supporter. The negative for them was that they did build credit for credit losses that they expect to increase down the line. Those shares down by eight-tenths of a percent at this point. Citigroup lined up for 8 a.m. And, of course, we are looking at BlackRock as well. We haven't mentioned it. The shares unchanged. But it is interesting to note BlackRock reported earnings with eight decline in the amount of uh, flows that it's seen with a decline in total assets and a decline when it comes to withdrawals from their active funds. Then if you take a look across assets, United Health was interesting. They also reported uh, earnings and they beat estimates by a significant margin and they also increased their forecast going forward, which is interesting at a time when so many people are expecting health care costs to increase and actually contribute to some of the inflationary push. They are seeing more enrollment, 1.7% gain in pre-market trading. And then I looked at the Bitcoin sector, Tom, because Matt Miller is here, so I had to. Oh. Uh, Marathon Digital and MicroStrategy both uh, doing pretty well today because of the Bitcoin uh, gains that we are seeing. Again, marginal, but it shows right. how much these are really uh, adding to the marginal move in frothier assets and the risk appetite. Yeah. Quickly here, Matt, what's the so what of the Celsius bankruptcy? Why do I care? 
Well, the main reason that I care is because we show or we learn um, just how connected Sam Bankman Fried really is. I mean, um, his FTX and uh, his, his other funds are, have, have their tentacles deep into all of these different crypto uh, lenders and businesses, and it's just amazing. Some have called him the JP Morgan of crypto. Okay, well, how's the JP Morgan doing? 60,000 down to 20,000. JP Morgan itself says mining costs are 13,000. How's this guy? doing given these losses well he still has 11 billion dollars and he's only 29 so i think he's doing all right okay well he'll be able to buy the hummer hv that uh the ev i should say that john farrow's looking at uh this weekend right now on the fixed income market michael collins senior portfolio manager at pgm joins us right now michael i love 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 your research note where you talk about the relative value trade the relative value rationalization that's out there Amid all this volatility, you can't do it, can you? Yeah, the uh, the markets, Jonathan, the the credit markets are actually uh, performing pretty uh, in a pretty controlled way. I mean, this sell off, as brutal as it seems, has actually been been pretty orderly. Uh, but there are a lot of really good relative value opportunities, right? I don't know if it's a great time to jump in. Right and buy rates or buy credit. But man, there are a lot of really interesting opportunities starting to arise. What is a relative value trade? Construct a trade for us here in real time. I'm asking for a friend. I mean, the, the one, the, the, the easy one that jumps out at everybody uh, that hasn't been working uh, is just in our, in our plain old uh, state treasury market, Tom, you know, that 20 year treasury, uh, which they've talked about for a long time and issued a couple of years ago and actually put on a treasury future. Uh, just recently uh, is really one of the cheapest bonds in the world on a relative basis. I mean, you know, this is a little inside baseball, but you can buy a 20 year treasury, sell a 10 year and 30 year treasury. So you have no interest rate risk or curve risk or credit risk and pick up a lot of relative value. Right. So that's something that really jumps yeah, out. Lisa, of that's like called a condor or a parakeet or a, <laughs> gold, a golden eagle. I, I don't know what that's called, but it, it's something. It's I called. Well, it. Tom, it, it is called trading into a less liquid asset. Mm, means that everybody actually makes gives money. you a bit more <laughs> in terms of premium and then you can cash out. But, Michael, how much can you go into less liquidity for more yield at a time when everybody is saying liquidity reigns supreme? Yeah, well, I mean, that, Lisa, should not be an illiquid asset, right? It's a 20-year on-the-run uh, treasury that was just issued. They just did a, an add-on auction uh, this week. Uh, they have a treasury future. I mean, that should be one of the most liquid bonds in the world. But it is, for some reason, trading, as you said, with this huge illiquidity premium uh, that should not exist. So, I mean, that will eventually earn money. Maybe it'll take 20 years, right? But but that will uh, earn money. But but there are other less liquid assets uh, that are starting to feel the pain here too. Well, and that's what I wanted to ask though, Michael, because when people go into less liquidity, they might be betting on a longer term outcome, but in the short term, there can still be those fissures that Michael Shaul was talking about, some sort of illiquidity crisis in a way. How much are you banking on that not happening by trading into certain, certain instruments like this uh, versus just saying it doesn't really matter because longer term is longer term? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I mean, I get asked all the time about what are the th cracks in the system? What are the things that could bring this, you know, uh, system down? And it's really hard to find them, right, Lisa? The, the credit quality, as we always talk about uh, in corporate America, in the high yield market, is really solid. Liquidity is good. The banking system, notwithstanding some of these earnings issues we're seeing, I mean, the banks are solid gold from a credit quality standpoint, right? They are um, really solid from a capital standpoint. The housing market, notwithstanding the fact that it's going to go down, right? house prices will probably be 10 or 15% lower in a year from now than they are oh. now, uh, but they are not owned on a levered basis, right? What I see- I just the, the bought one. <laughs> well, yeah, good. Someone's got to buy at the top of the market, man. And I so, stretched. So, yeah, so so the, uh, the areas that are, I'm worried about, Lisa, are the areas that are less liquid that don't trade, right? So think of the private debt markets. Think of the commercial real estate markets, right? They're all still marked at par. If you had to sell 100 pieces of commercial real estate today, I mean, you would have to take a 10 or 15% haircut, right? That is, that is something that has to still happen.
Michael, I, uh, fortunately, I funded my purchase shorting JGBs. Um, I can't believe we haven't talked about the yen an hour and 36 minutes into Bloomberg surveillance here. At 138.70, and we've been above 139 the last couple of days, is it like a no-loss proposition uh, to short this currency as a carry trade? Yeah, you know, there's it's it's there's never a no loss proposition in, in currencies, Matt. And I, you know, modeled uh, tried to model currencies, you know, 30 years ago, and it is really hard. They are the most difficult asset, if you will, to try to figure out a fair value on, right? And they tend to trend. And right now, the dollar, I think it's more of the dollar is going up, right? Every other currency is going down versus the dollar. And the great thing if there is a great thing about currencies, is they are the great equalizer, right? I mean, the U.S. is the strongest economy in the world right now. We do have inflation. We have a central bank that's hiking rates aggressively, where some others are starting to blink. Uh, so the dollar strength will ultimately weaken our earnings, weaken our economy, get inflation back down, and support these other economies that need it. What do you uh, buy right now on the curve? I was talking to Gary Schilling, who's buying the dollar, but obviously he makes dollars also. Um, he says he's buying the 30-year, uh, the long bond right now, and that seems to be consensus. Well, I talked about the 20-year, but that's kind of a, a nuance. But yeah, I think, I think adding duration in the U.S. and maybe in other places in the world, actually European rates, even though they're lower than, than ours, uh, there are more rate hikes priced in uh, by the European Central Bank in Europe than there are from this point on in the U.S., and I don't think they're going to get the, those off. So so I think interest rates in general have probably gotten too high around right. the world, and they are going to come down over the next 6, 12, 18, 24 months, and that, I think, is probably one of the first things to, to really add value. Uh, Michael, what's a 10-year target here for you? I know it's really not the PGM game to do a sell-side kind of guesstimate on the 10-year yield. But what is the PGM feel for where the 10 years heading? All right. So let's say it's it's three ish right now. Right. I mean, I think it's going to be two before it's four. Wow. I mean, that's the, that's the long term wow. trade, Tom. Right. I mean, the Fed might get that funds rate to three and a half. But in two, three yeah. years from now, it's it's going to be lower. It might be lower in six, 12 months from now, Tom. I mean, that's kind of the mm -hmm. part of the cycle we're in. We're in a big inflection point here. Uh, economic activity around the world and in the U.S. is rolling over. A lot harder, I think, and a lot more quickly than, than even the Fed would be comfortable with. <clears throat> Obviously, we have this stagflation risk, but, right. but ultimately, if you look through uh, this near-term inflation issue, I mean, rates are going to be lower. Michael, thank you so much. Michael Collins here with PGM really showing up the divide, Lisa Abramo, it's, that we see from a distant 2% yield out to a distant 4% yield. And right now what we're seeing is that a number of people, more people are weighing in on that 2% than that 4%. Just want to bring this to you, uh, that there is a uh, survey that was just published, the results of which show that about 50% uh, odds of a U.S. recession currently are baked into the market and are currently what economists expect. Mm -hmm. That's fascinating. And within the next well, year, let alone after that, how much <clears throat> that has changed from just a couple months ago? On the Citigroup earnings, and Lisa, thank you for mentioning it because it was off my radar and it sh I was really quite wrong on this. We have the proverbial Seattle slew of economic data today. And I'm sorry, retail sales could adjust that recession guesstimate that each of us has. And it could adjust how far the Fed decides to go at their meeting in about 10 days. How much are they going to take this, this sort of cue from the consumer strength or lack thereof? What's a worse print for the market right now? A uh, higher than expected uh, yeah. number if you get people actually going out and spending that encourages the Fed to be more aggressive or a lower than expected spend that all of a sudden confirms some of the weakness that people are already baking into their expectations. Matt, 10 a.m., the five year out, the then five year out from that, the f total 10 year inflation view of the University of Michigan. I guess we'll see how unanchored we are. Yeah, absolutely. Although it is interesting that the conference board numbers aren't nearly as pessimistic as yeah, the U no, of M. It could that's true. be something to do with those Wolverines in Ann Arbor. <clears throat> well, I don't know. I, I would say that's extremely well said. There's huge divides here from the caution of Atlanta GDP out to more constructive data as well. We have constructive data in the market with futures up 12. The VIX 26.15 Dow futures up 137. Good morning.
Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Ritika Gupta. President Biden wants Saudi Arabia to increase its oil output to help curb soaring gasoline prices in the U.S. He travels there today from Israel, but Bloomberg's learned that after the president meets with Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, there will be no public announcements on boosting oil supply. A person familiar with the matter says talks will continue regarding output from members of the OPEC Plus cartel. Senator Joe Manchin has delivered a huge blow to President Biden's ambitious economic agenda. Manchin, a Democrat, told party leaders he would not support new spending on climate measures or tax increases. Manchin says he will back proposals on health care and drug prices. The European Union is falling behind on its high-profile promises to deliver a substantial aid package to Ukraine. Almost two months ago, EC President uh, Ursula von der Leyen proposed spending $9 billion in loans, but only a fraction of that has been agreed on so far. The EU is facing severe economic pain from inflation and the possible cut-off of Russian gas. The world's largest marketplace for non-fungible tokens, OpenSea, is cutting 20% of its staff. The company warned of a prolonged downturn amid the collapse in crypto prices and broader economic instability. OpenSea has seen its sales cut in half over the past month. The average price of an NFT on its marketplace dropped by nearly 40%. And the wave of airline delays in the US this year is mostly self-inflicted. The share of delays caused by airlines, as opposed to weather or air traffic control, has surged to the highest level on record. That's according to data reviewed by Bloomberg News. Through April, airlines triggered about 58% of late flights in 2022. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Tape, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. As far as uh, Europe is concerned and the ECB is concerned, they're in a much tougher spot. There is a shutdown of, of Nord Stream 1 that's going to lead to a significantly sharp uh, decline in growth. So policy then becomes a lot more tricky than it is in the U.S. Exceptionally strong yesterday where the Sobrata Rajapa, head of U.S. rate strategy out of Paris, a society uh, general. And I do want to note the ECB meeting uh, next week, John Farrow and I, are really quite focused on that. We think it's going to be more, you know, we make jokes, it's a snooze fest. That's highly unlikely uh, into next week. Someone who knows this is someone who lives where I, well, I sort of don't know where it is on the map, in Luxembourg, hmm. which is in the vicinity of Belgium and Germany and France. And that would be Sebastian Galli. He's had done some good work over the years, always thinking with important research notes with Nordia and Sub Galli joins us this morning. Lisa? Well, yeah, Sebastian Gelly, thank you so much for being with us because right now we are looking at what could be a real storm in Europe next week, and especially with the Nord Stream 1 supposedly coming back online. At this point, what does the ECB do? How much do they try to get ahead of this, especially in the face of Italy? Well, so as you can see, complex situations, my colleague from Societe Generale was uh, pointing out, it is not a good situation. The odds are very strong that the pipeline will stay closed or at a very low debit. Uh, and the reason is that we are in a war between uh, the West and uh, and Russia via Ukraine. And they have to strike us because they have to uh, hit the source of funding and the source of weapons going into Ukraine. And the ECB knows this. So it's faced, uh, according to the Bundestag, maybe with up to 2% higher inflation because of natural gas prices. Uh, spiking even higher. So something which is fairly deleterious. And what can the ECB do when it's so far behind the curve? It needs to reassure um, the uh, ECB governor is, is very credible. She's a very good communicator. She's very reassuring. So she probably will do a very good job bringing the rest of the council with her. But she has to accelerate the pace of rate hikes. And we're starting to talk about 25, 50, maybe a series of 50 basis points. Maybe they will surprise us with 50 basis points at this meeting. They need to reestablish the narrative. And having done so, they're left like the United States and hiking maybe too much because it takes a long time between the hiking process and inflation eventually coming down. And what the ECB is hoping is that oil prices collapse by themselves on the back of an expected global recession. The process has started. It might take a few more months, but eventually it should be much lower. And it will help very significantly not only the United States, but also Europe.
So, uh, Sebastian, we were talking about the idea of the ECB going more aggressively, and it raised the concern of Italy, of peripheral spreads, of bond yields surging as the ECB moves away. The ECB came out, they said, we will control that, we will reinvest some of our uh, holdings into other regions that need it. How difficult does it become from a political perspective, given what is going on in Italy with the potential uh, disruption in government? It's not sustainable. It's a blank check, right? Um, Europe or the Eurozone, to be more precise, is a social contract that if you do the right thing, we'll do the right thing with you. But if you have the parties such as uh, M uh, Five Stars starting to break apart this contract, looking only at their own interests and not a national and a European interest, then the entire thing can blow apart as happened in uh, several emerging markets. You can think of Argentina with a serial defaults. It, they default and default and default again. And that's a situation Italy is essentially faced with this. Do they want to have a government of national unity? Well, they have the votes to do it even without five stars. So it's not as bad as it looks like, but the ECB cannot give something unconditionally to Italy without Italy delivering something. And that means from a legal point of view, but also from a political point of view, it is actually very difficult to have an anti-fragmentation tool, which is perfectly efficient. They can do a lot. Mm. They can surprise the market. It <clears throat> could give us funding, for example, to asset managers and wealth managers, and we would buy that uh, European debt, and probably we would like to. Yeah, I'm sure that would be great for you. And probably the governing council, for the most part, wants to do that with the transmission protection mechanism, the TPM, as I'm sure we'll all be uh, calling it in, in, in a couple of days. Not Joachim Nagel, right? Not the Bundesbank. They're not all for this. How is that, um, how is that relationship going to work out? Well, the right, Nagel represent. you have always this good cop, bad cop uh, regime in Europe. Italy plays, uh, or Spain will play the good cop, uh, Germany will play the bad cop, and the French will basically oscillate between the two and try to play for the center. And this is how Europe essentially works. Nagel represents part of the opinion within the Eurozone, even within Spain, Italy, and France, but not one they can express on a public basis. They say, look, there is a legal framework. It is Germany and Austria, also northern countries, are very important politically, so you can't give a, fr a free check, a blank check to Italy to do whatever it wants when uh, five stars just does well spend spend more. There's no problem as long as it's for the people I care about. Um, and and so it just doesn't work. And the Germans say, okay, it's our time to play the bad guy. He's waited a long time to it. He's been very nice until now. What what levels are you watching in terms of spread, Sebastian? We saw. Um, a BTP bond spreads blow out to like 200, 220 basis points. What's what's concerning? It's not that concerning because what it tells you is that the market is really risk seeking in the sense we, we have PGIM coming before and saying let's extend duration even in Europe. And this is uh, something which is uh, quite common amongst asset managers. They want to extend duration even though they don't have the data. We are still in that process basically of inflation overshooting and not being certain what the dynamics are because they're so incredibly complex. Um, and they want to extend and as they extend of course it maintains curves at relatively low levels. So Italy might have seen frightening for a while until the anti-fragmentation tool came in, or at least <clears> the <throat> perception of it, but it could have been a lot, lot worse. And what you, one should consider is that the risk reward is not particularly good right now because the, the equilibrium is what we call unstable. It doesn't take very much either for it to go much higher or much lower. And I believe the ECB will do the right thing at the, at the right time, but it's not a free check. Sebastian Gelli, thank you so much with Nordia Luxembourg. Greatly appreciate it uh, this morning. Futures up 11, Dow futures up 136. Nice lift to the market with the VIX constructively in. Getting near a 25 level, which I would suggest is a huge, huge deal. Lisa, as we go to Citigroup here, I believe it's in six uh, minutes. I want to drift back to JP Morgan yesterday, where on first blush, there was a fair amount of gloom about that report. And I'm sorry, I saw a lot of news organizations say, yeah, but about three hours later. Well, if you take a look at where the gloom came from, our first knee-jerk reaction was, look at that, they're suspending share buybacks. That yeah. must be them battening down the hatches for that hurricane. And then Jamie Dimon came out and railed against regulators, railed against the stress tests that actually required them to hold back on some of the uh, share buybacks or at least build enough capital and said, things are fine. Things are good. The consumer's looking fine. This isn't going to be some sort of uh, Armageddon in markets. So, uh, Tom, you're looking at right now uh, a bifurcated message of the now versus the later. And we're hearing that from so many chief executive officers right now.
Oh, we're seeing that, Matt. And in the banking business here, I'm sorry, I'm going to go into the divide between the European banks and the American banks. Citigroup is their arch international bank. I mean, going into Europe right now seems to be a bit of a challenge. Yeah, no, absolutely. Going into Europe has been a bit of a challenge for uh, a solid <clears throat> decade, right? Yeah. Um, it, it's, it's always been difficult for foreign banks to come in and make money, and there aren't very many great examples of those who have. We're going to get to that. Jane Frazier is going to report here on what Citigroup is doing. And again, off of Wells Fargo, was a little bit of confusion off a corrected headline there. Wells Fargo, Morgan Stanley, and uh, J.P. Morgan out. We hear from Citigroup next. Futures up 11. Good morning. in Europe is definitely impacting what's happening in the U.S. I think that actually we're pretty much near the peaking of the CPI. Conditions are rapidly changing in front of our eyes, and I'm not sure people have kind of latched onto that. One of the things that we're trying to adjust here is to a market that is more on its own. I do think that recession is probably a little bit sooner rather than later. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Bank earnings and retail sales to stir the muddy soup. Good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on Bloomberg Radio and Bloomberg Television. Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. John Farrow off. Matt Miller very much in. And Tom, I am looking ahead to those retail sales to the University of Michigan uh, Consumer <laughs> Sentiment Survey and how much can it actually direct a market that is taking cues from so many varied inputs that is highly confusing and reaching a stasis. I guess that Jane Frazier is also going to be looking at retail sales. I will look at the control group, Lisa, and the answer is it was a grim number last time around when you adjust for everything out. How is America doing as a consumer? And that's important to Citigroup. Right now we're seeing Citigroup reporting a second quarter earnings per share at $2.19. They were dripping out as we get them. And we'll get to Shanali Basik. But one uh, thing that we've noticed, and as we get some of these breaking news, Tom, we've been looking at the banks as a bellwether for a consumer that has not yet turned. So when you talk about retail sales, that's going to be an interesting note to understand how far along mm -hmm. in that process we are. Well, it's different to see in the headlines sequence here of Citigroup uh, is 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 it's a clumsier release of data than we see from the other banks with some of the banks folks we can really boom see right away yeah that JP Morgan's struggling here the first blush I have out of Citigroup is really not all that with you know we we have a tendency within three zip codes of New York folks to go to what's called FIC trading, uh, and there I see a pretty good statistic, Lisa. Well, we are looking at a headline earnings per share beat of two dollars and nineteen cents, and Matt, we that was the estimate of one dollar and sixty nine yeah. cents. You saw this FIC uh, sales and trading beat of four point one billion dollars versus an estimate of three point eight uh, billion dollars. We are seeing a better than expected kind of result trickling out from a company that really has faced so much trouble and turmoil in terms of. Uh, uh, of, of turnover and uh, upper staff, yeah. as well as mission. I, I mean, I don't think there's any clumsy drippiness here at all. It's crystal clear. It's a beat um, that knocks the cover right off the ball. Uh, Citigroup EPS, 219. Estimate, 170. Much better than expected. Citigroup revenue, 19.6. Estimate, 18.4. Much better than expected. Citigroup trading revenue, 4.08 billion. Estimate, 3.84 billion. Much better than expected. I mean, bang, bang, bang. Yeah. These headlines come out as beat, beat, beat. And right now you're seeing the shares go up, 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 at 2.3% pop in those shares pre-market trading. As uh, some of these headlines are registered, Shanali Basik, our uh, stalwart Wall Street reporter here, parsing through some of the numbers. Shanali, what do you got? A few things here, Lisa. That fixed income trading beat is massive for Citigroup. Remember, Jane Fraser is trying to turn around this bank, exit operations, but also invest. And now you are seeing that in the results for their trading desk in an, in, in an era where J.P. Morgan missed Wall Street expectations. Remember, currencies, commodities, these are the trading desks of the season. And so winning on those counts for something, certainly here. Remember, I would also say you are seeing provisions tick a little higher up. We will look for more color from that from Citigroup, especially because they have that big global waiting. Are they worried about recessionary forces elsewhere in the world? And I've got to also say they, they simply just beat on revenue. Remember, for Citigroup, they were trading at half 
of their book value relative to any other bank, big bank in the United States, Lisa, they were cheapest. And so you do see that lift in the shares this morning off of this beat, especially because good news is very welcome news in a very tough environment. To be very clear, Shanali, when we talk about beating expectations, it's both a call on the expectations as well as the performance of a firm. How much does this speak to a broader macro backdrop versus a specific underestimation of the turnaround Round affair that John Frazier is running over at Citigroup. It's interesting. You and I were talking about this yesterday that the trading desks needed to save the day here because there are muted expectations. Net interest income is already really baked in here. There's not an expectation that higher interest rates will help much more than they're already starting to help the banks. And so to stand steady in trading is really important right now because you could just as easily start losing a lot of money in that business once volatility gets out of control. But you guys have been talking about it constantly on the program, volatility is not out of control. It is in a sweet spot. And you're also seeing Citigroup, in addition to fixed income trading, really meet expectations on equities, which is in a tough environment right now with such little issuance. Well, and Citi is unique among these banks in that, as Tom uh, was talking about earlier, it's the most international. It reaches across the Atlantic Ocean, not only into the continent of Europe, but into Russia. And that's been an issue here. What do we know about um, Citi's exit from Vladimir Putin? Putin's Russia. You know, it's funny. We spoke to Jane Fraser just a couple of months ago over in Los Angeles. She was just getting off of a trip from Poland. And what she said to me was, we're getting on with it. So they are doing as much as they can, as fast as they can to exit their operations in Russia, but also in elsewhere in the world where they had said they would. Well, Shanali Vasek, thank you so much. We'll get you some more. I'm giving you some more time to really parse through these numbers and I get back to you later in the hour. This all bleeds into the broader picture, which is perhaps investment banking has been suffering on the deal side, but trading very much an interesting moment given all of the volatility. Jeff Yu has been tracking all of it as senior EMEA market strategist at BNY Mellon. And Jeff, taking a look at the soup of this week, what will emerge to you as the most important data point amid earnings, amid retail sales, amid consumer uh, expectations? Retail sales plus U.S. corporate earnings equals U.S. continues to outperform. You know, this is a, a view which uh, somewhat goes against um, our expectation that the dollar's valuations were starting to look a bit expensive um, and the like. Um, but the fact is, if you look at where euro dollars trading, you look at where cable is, you look at Asia struggling, China's growth struggling, the U.S. is still where they're at. So those asset allocation flows will probably still <clears throat> continue to favor the U.S., but selectively. Jeff, I've been dying to talk to you. You and I have read James Hamilton of the University of San Diego, and we understand Brownian motion, which is the back and forth, the randomness of a trend, mm -hmm. and these two odd words, drift and trend. Japanese yen is looking like a zombie. I was thunderstruck on yen weakness that the way it was weak. What do you make of the mathematical lethargy of weaker Japanese yen? Uh, well, uh, Governor Kuroda will very respectfully and politely tell you that this is still not the right kind of inflation that Japan is getting. It's irrelevant as far as he's concerned. He's going to say, sure, that's going to drive higher prices, imported prices. He wants to see, see wages grow up. But if Japanese corporate behavior does not change, uh, then will that help his case for tighter policy? No, it won't. So if we go through U.S. corporate earnings, you know, what are their <clears throat> wage costs? Is that eating into U.S. margins? It may hurt earnings, but I think that's a good thing. It keeps the U.S. consumer afloat and flourish them even. That probably isn't happening in Japan, even though right. their wage benchmarks in uh, what, 110. In, in, in what level a week yen, 110, 120, 130, dare I say 140, 150, at what level of yen does the flourishing end? I'm glad you asked that. It ends for Kuroda. It ends for the Japanese Ministry of Finance when Madam Yellen calls her <laughs> counterpart in Tokyo and says, enough is enough. This is yep. getting to where we were in the 80s. Do we need a new accord? Right. What's the best hotel in New York to sign it? Lisa, on an international basis, what you just heard is the quote of the week from Jeffrey Yu. Secretary Yellen is going to call up and say, 
enough. Yeah, and that's exactly definitely, what's going to happen. Well, perhaps that's the case right now. She's backed away from some sort of coordinated effort to support yeah. the end. And Matt, you've been covering that as well. And sort she of what this said. means. Yeah, what this means in terms of this as being a breaking point that's going to have to happen. I mean, she. I think she has to wait at least two weeks before a complete and total 180, right? She just said at the beginning of this week, um, G7 currencies are not to be messed with. The free market mess mechanism has to be left on its own. Jeff, the question for me is how long until um, the market can break Corota, right? They continue to short this yen, they continue to short JGBs, and I know it's unique in that the Bank of Japan owns more than 50% of uh, all of its, all of its uh, domestic sovereign debt, but how long can they hold on? Well, the yen and JGBs, those are very different things, right? So the yen, uh, again, we go back um, to those conversations between the finance ministers and Kuroda himself will say, this is not my purview. FX policy belongs to the Japanese Ministry of Finance. So that's where it's at. But JGBs still not the right trade. That's where Japan comes through. I'm still looking for a bit of an RBA-like scenario, what we saw last year, where one day the market is in, they're looking for bids from the BOJ, there's no one on the other side. That's when expectations <coughs> are going to come. And that's where we get the multi-standard deviation move in Japanese right. asset volatility and triggers the end of it. This is so important, folks. We're going to extend Jeffrey Yu today. I know Global Wall Street will love this. He is with BNY Mellon. But what we're going to do here is really focus on EM. Damien Sassauer of Bloomberg Intelligence out with an absolutely blistering note now I, I, this weekend, I should say, in the last hour, I should say, for your weekend reading. And Sassauer minces no words on the deterioration that we see and EM. We're going to continue that with uh, Jeffrey Yu. I don't even know where to begin, Lisa Bramwitz, on e uh, EM. We can go to something idiosyncratic like Turkey, but Thailand is not in idiosyncratic. Yeah, you're seeing these pockets. How do they keep up with a Fed that's <clears throat> they going don't. to raise rates? And how do they keep up with the haven trade of going into the dollar at the same time that they're facing inflation issues, at the same time that they need to import basic commodities that are facing structural challenges that are causing prices to rise? It's messy out there, and you're seeing that reflected right. by the price. Sticking on that and trout fishing in Idaho, I believe Mr. McKee will get up in the stark cold Idaho morning. Lisa, retail sales, a big deal. Retail sales. Also, later, we're going to get University of Michigan consumer sentiment. Uh, also, the Empire manufacturing mm. data, yeah. a peripheral uh, one, but interesting nonetheless. Citigroup. Maybe it's a new Citigroup. We shall see. Futures up 7. Dow Futures up 112. The VIX near a 25 level. That's a wow statistic. Good morning. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word on Ritika Gupta. President Biden travels to Saudi Arabia today. Bloomberg's learned he'll leave the Middle East without any public announcements on increasing oil supply. The president hoped to come away with something that could help curbing soaring gasoline prices. The president meets with Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman today. He'll talk with other leaders from the oil exporting Persian Gulf on Saturday. And President Biden says the time is, quote, not right to restart negotiations between Palestinians and Israel. Still, after meeting with Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas in Bethlehem, he said he would look for ways to reinvigorate the peace process. Abbas urged the president to take steps towards a two-state solution, which Biden has long said he supports. And in the UK, the race to succeed Boris Johnson as Conservative Party leader and Prime Minister goes on TV today. The five remaining candidates will face off in a televised debate. Former Chancellor Rishi Sunak and Trade Minister Penny Mordaunt pulled ahead of their rivals in the second round of voting Thursday. The next ballot is Monday. And China's economy grew at the slowest pace since it was first hit by the coronavirus two years ago. GDP rose a less than expected four-tenths of one percent in the second quarter. That underlines the impact the strict COVID-0 policy has had. Beijing is now likely to miss its goal of about 5.5 percent growth for the full year by a wide margin. And clients at BlackRock didn't put as much money into the firm's long-term funds as analysts expected. Net inflows totaled $69 billion for the last three months that ended in June, the $40 billion less than anticipated. BlackRock's total assets under management fell to $8.5 trillion. There were at least $10 trillion at the end of last year. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg.
I think they're misjudging neutral. The 2.5% neutral rate is a neutral rate that existed when inflation was still at 2%. And we're not at 2% anymore, and it's a nominal rate. So that neutral rate is, is probably higher, uh, and I think the Fed has got some work to do. Conrad DeCadros, really on fire yesterday with Breen Capital. And hey, I'm not going to miss words here. Lisa, help me here. I think it's so important. There's a gap here of 2%, 2.5%. We heard that from Michael Collins of PGM earlier. And then there's 3-ish. Is that right, Lisa? Center tendencies like 3-ish? Yeah, that basically and, priced into the market right now is 3.7% yeah. for an end of the year Fed funds rate. And there's a group about at 4 Breen Capital is out of 4.5%. Well, and then get this from Jim Reed over at Deutsche Bank saying that 10-year Treasury should be below 2%. So talk about wow, a bifurcation wow. of views. So there's where we are on the weekend and into the weekend reading, and some of that is tangential. Let's play that you're Secretary Yellen and you need a brief on EM, and there's no one better we can do that with. And Jeffrey Yu, he's senior EMA market strategist at BNY Mellon and carries all the heritage of Jonathan Anderson at UBS from decades ago. I want to talk, Jeff, you about the Thai bot in a 20 percent depreciation off of the pandemic. And all of that is strong dollar. I get that. And as I mentioned to Dr. Alarian earlier this week, J.P. Morgan EMFX is basically on a decade long 48 percent decline. Powell is central banker to the world. How fragile is Jerome Powell's Bangkok? How fragile is his Jakarta? Uh, well, unfortunately, all roads um, lead to uh, Beijing, right? Uh, if uh, the borders don't open, there are no Chinese tourists um, filling the coffers, filling the current account of ASEAN nations of Southeast Asia, it's still going to be a struggle. You know, these countries, and we're anticipating reopening, uh, you, you just can't turn around an economy like that and from services based into something more self reliant, self contained um, overnight or even in the course of two years. So it's still going to be right. quite tricky, but a lot are hiking as well. They know they can't take this. On a relative basis, with the Arthur Burns-like magnitudes of American central banking, Witness Bank of Canada, uh, this week, how does EM adapt to that besides constructively lifting rates like we saw in the Philippines this week? Uh, well, there are two ways. In one, uh, you've got to uh, you know, move on rates, which has been seen and above and beyond uh, market expectations. Uh, but two, you've got to realize, and as the rest of the world has been doing, you know, we are in a world of deglobalization. Your previous supply chains, your previous sources of export revenue, they're going to be there, not going to be there anymore. So invest domestically. The good thing is no one's talking about balance of payments crisis. No one's talking about 1998. There's no dollar leverage globally. Very limited positioning in global mom markets. Have a credible fiscal and growth strategy. And as that barbell with U.S. equities and fixed income on one side and the U.S. dollar cash on the other side, as they seek to fill the middle, I think EM, especially in Asia, will be in a good place um, to um, hold that. Uh, but it's going to take time. And Jeff, in the cross currents of EM and the dependency on the dollar, how connected is something like the retail sales figure that we're going to get out in about 10 minutes time or even the University of Michigan confidence survey because of how much permission it gives the Fed to raise rates even further than what people are currently expecting? That's absolutely a nail on the head. It's no longer a story about, oh, well, U.S. consumers and buy exports from the rest of the world. It's how is the, this going to push their head? Because um, if the, it, because if it really pushes the Fed towards a 100 basis point hike, you know, for example, then whatever expectations that any EM central bank had for their next meeting, you add 25 on top of that. You add 50 on top of that. You need to run faster just to stay still. That's the challenge um, right now. And you're not getting any help, especially in Asia. You're not getting any help from China right now. And some are starting to keel over. Look at Central Eastern Europe, 200 basis points in mm. cuts being priced in now by Poland and Czech Republic because they need to do so much now. They'll have to cut aggressively later. Are we going to see uh, 100 basis points. I mean, Jeff, um, the market pricing has gone up and then back down, now maybe headed back up. But, you know, Neil Kashkari unveiled his dot plot with 3.9% at the end of this year and 4.4% at the end of next year, and he's a dove. Mm -hmm. So I think 75 um, should be uh, the consensus for the time being. Now, here's the thing. We should have markets pricing in 4% 
terminal or above 4% terminal. So that's key. But pricing in doesn't mean we get there. By virtue of pricing that in, that's a tight in financial conditions. If that can tame inflation right. expectations as well, we don't have to get there. But that process needs to run the course, and we're not there yet. Jeff Yu, thank you so much. Generous of you to join us for this extended visit. He is with BNY Mellon, and he's watching what I'm watching, which is the Pacific at RIM. We need to stop now midway through our bank extravaganza with Chanel Bassick, and I really take issue with, yeah, I get it, the short-term good news report on Citigroup, I get. Let us remember that this was a train wreck and Jane Frazier's picking up the pieces. Uh, this was a pre, uh, this was a one for 10 reverse split a zillion years ago. For mm. fossils like me, a $44 stock is really $4.41. If you look back to 2007, it's basically the other banks with Moynihan coming on and Citigroup, an absolute train wreck. And as Shanali mentioned earlier, where you see it is in book value, that ancient, ancient old world at ratio. Citigroup. Less than half book, J.P. Morgan premium priced, 1.25 book, and even dog of dogs, good morning, John Stump, Wells Fargo, off, almost out near one times book. This shows the task Jane Frazier has. Yeah, and it's pretty amazing, Tom, how quickly she's starting to pivot the bank. How's she doing it? What is she, is she just screaming? Well, listen, the investors is initially- she like Sandy Bernstein where she's up on the table, running <laughs> around the table, screaming at people? She has a different style. What's the style? It's an effective communication style, and she calls it the school of empathy. And so that is a very different style from the Wall Street of old, as we all know. But it is an effective communication style where she's taken thousands of employees. Yeah, Tom Keene is laughing at me, but it is a different is type Jack of... Is Jack Black going to be in this movie? <laughs> you can ask her who she wants to School play, Mark Mason especially, because the, her and Mark Mason, the CFO, they operate as a very tight-knit group, and they are aligning thousands of employees around them to guide this transformation. On a conference call, how, are they just cutting costs? It seems like no. there's more pixie dust than they, that. They've recently also <clears throat> said that they are going to be spending also not just to well, exit certain operations, but you see it in the fixed income numbers. You see it in the advisory <clears throat> numbers. You see them beating on expectations okay. in advisory where many have failed. And, you know, again, yeah. they have a long way to go. I don't want to overstate this. However, <clears throat> their investments paid off at least for this quarter. Well, let's go to the professor at the School of Empathy, Lisa Abramowitz, for observation. <laughs> Thank Here, you. The School of Empathy. Thank you, Tom. I want to pivot so to retail sensitive. sales. I'm just going to totally go and yeah, do another segue. Shanali Vasek, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. I do want to just take a look at what we're looking for in terms of retail sales. The expectation, the headline number for the control group is for a gain of 0.3%, which trails inflation. Tom, it will be really compelling to look at the well, gas uh, expenditures mixed with some of the other yeah. expenditures and how that parses out to indicate how much people are deciding what they buy given the prices uh, yeah, elsewhere. Yeah, I'll go with that. McKee's way better than this, folks, but Lisa brings up the key point here, which is like a lot of other statistics, these are really inflation phased, inflation adjusted, inflation beaten up. But we'll get that retail sales and Michael McKee will give us the inflation adjusted perspective we can as well. And then outstanding on wage inflation, Thomas Purcelli will join us from RBC capital markets. Red and green on the screen. Market gives back a little bit. Stay with us. Good morning, everyone. Bloomberg surveillance with retail sales out here. We are thrilled that Vincent Reinhart will darken the door here in a moment. The last time he was on, he was nothing short of outstanding. But first, we have to look at, well, the import price index and retail sales, and then on we go at 9.15 and 45 minutes to industrial production. And there we go to the really interesting thing. I was never a big fan of this, but the University of Michigan statistics at 10 a.m. Uh, as well. This comes out the sort of the way that Mike McKee fishes. He's on the south fork of the Snake River, and he's sort of takes the fly rod and drifts it out and launches in to see how the water moves. And then the data comes out ever so slowly from the fishing, and he 
reels it in and takes it out. This is Tom's way of saying the data is not, late. That is what he's trying to say. Tries to not hook the line into David Kotak's line. And Keep then they stalling, pull it Tom. in ever so slowly <laughs> as they wait for the data from the river to come out. And I sit in the line, and I've got the little spinner, Lisa, with a red and white pop thing that floats along. Yeah, and here it is. Worm, you caught something. With a worm hung on it. And with the worm hung on it, I get the bites, and they don't. Let's go to Michael McKee <laughs> as we finally get a little bit of data out here on retail sales. Michael, is it America buoyant? <laughs> it is America buoyant. Retail sales up 1% on a month-over-month -month basis. It's a little bit better than we saw, uh, than we were expecting, and it is certainly better than it was the prior month. Uh, retail sales had come in down three-tenths on a headline basis. Now, uh, X autos X gas retail sales up seven-tenths, so gasoline taking a bite out of that. And the control group that you were talking about, we're still waiting for that uh, calculation to be made. That's a calculation right. you do take out uh, uh, gasoline, food, and uh uh, yeah. building materials. And now that comes in at up 0.8% after being flat the prior month. So an eight tenths gain, which is good news, uh, even uh, mm. given the fact that you have to deflate all this on, a, on an inflation adjusted basis, pretty much all of your uh, retail sales are going to be negative for the month. The Empire Manufacturing Index does show improvement 11.1 debt from minus 1.2, and their price indexes fell during the month. Uh, this is the first of the, uh, ma the major uh, regional manufacturing indexes to come out. It pointed to a down month last month, and uh, that's what we got. Import prices up two tenths of a percent and you take out gasoline and they were down four tenths so petroleum is making a big difference uh, when we see the uh, numbers for uh, import prices and of course we knew that that's having a big impact uh, overall on retail sales let me just look at the re uh, revisions to retail sales we thought they were down three tenths last month they were only down one tenth so that's uh, also a little bit better not going to make a whole lot of difference to the fed and they were down in the control group three tenths and we thought that was flat so uh bad news on the control side and better news on the uh, oh, uh the headline for the prior month but uh what we're looking at here in terms of retail sales for gasoline i'm just squinting at the numbers here uh yeah. Gasoline well, stations. I use glasses, uh, Mike. Up by 1.1%. Yes. Well, uh, Sorry, we'll I, let you. No, it's fine, Michael. Mike, we'll let you parse through the data with more granularity. Just want to bring you that what the reaction is in markets, the knee-jerk reaction is fascinating because what it seems to indicate is that just a touch bit of better than expected news would give more leeway to the Fed to hike rates. You're seeing a pop at front-end yields that price down, yield up 3.17%. And the knee-jerk response in equities was lower, crossing into the negative and then going uh, positive, fluctuating around zero for the S&P with the NASDAQ down about a tenth of a percent. Mike, how much does a data point like this that comes in marginally better than expected, still negative on an inflation-adjusted basis, change anything for the Federal Reserve? It probably doesn't change a lot. Uh, most Federal Reserve officials have, uh, that we've heard from have come out and said uh, 75 is their base case, and they would consider going to 100 if things looked bad. Uh, right now, things look about the same as they were. So maybe is it a green light? No, maybe a yellow light for 100 basis points. They'll have to make a decision based on something else that may be the Michigan numbers that come out later today. Michael McKee, thank you so much. Greatly appreciate it. And safe, safe travels. Uh, seriously, uh, Michael, this is a joy always to speak with Vincent Reinhardt. He and uh, uh, Carmen Reinhardt, his wife, wrote the essay of the pandemic on the global slowdown that now very much is clear, and on a global basis, they absolutely nailed the pandemic slowdown, some of it due to the political and social policies uh, seen in Asia. He is chief economist at Dreyfus in Mellon. Vince Reinhardt, the last time you were on, you were absolutely lights out on domestic analysis. This morning, I have to speak to you about Jerome Powell, as central banker to the world, and his good fortune to have Secretary Yellen assisting an EM crisis. Moments ago, folks, the nation of Chile intervened in currency markets to provide for an appreciation of the Chilean uh, peso. What's shocking, Vince Reinhardt, is even with the intervention by uh, Chile, 
to strengthen the Chilean peso. It barely moved the needle. Uh, uh, Vince moving two standard deviations. At best, it's a 27 percent appreciation across where, what they need to accomplish given the damage. At this moment, how urgent is it for Secretary Yellen to speak to Christina Gorgieva of the IMF about EM falling apart? Look, when the Federal Reserve raises interest rates, and we know the Federal Reserve is raising interest rates, uh, that pulls capital into financial centers and away uh, from EM. EM had a tough pandemic that they could, in part, smooth over by fiscal largesse that deteriorates balance sheets. Uh, and we're, we're going to be seeing that in, 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 in the year to come. So it's going to be a tough, tough time for EM. Any time the Fed is in a firming cycle, uh, it's tough for financial conditions generally. Right. And this will be an extremely tight firming cycle. Vince Reinhardt, across all of your academic work, there's always the amateur compare and contrast with 1998. I'm going to time, t call that a time of naivete and a time of leverage. Do we have comfort now that we're less naive? Do we have comfort now that we're less leveraged than August of 1998? Look, anytime financial prices move a lot, you learn something about somebody's balance sheet. You don't know that who that is and what you learn. So I'm not going to say that uh, uh, it, it's all clear. What do we know? We do know big banks are much better capitalized and are more rigorously monitored witness the stress test. We do know there's a lot more transparency in the documentation, lots more reliance on the big utilities of clearing and settlement. That's all good. We also know, among other things, that the Treasury market is less liquid now than it was back then. Uh, that's part of the consequence of QE, part of the consequence of, of, of big Treasury issuance, and it's also part of the ca consequence of asking big banks to have a lot of capital. They don't really want to commit as much to trading as they used to. And they're showing so that up. I'd say it's a mixed bag. Yeah. I mean, what a great uh, what a great position from which to go into a recession, Vince, right? Uh, the big banks uh, shoring up their fortress balance sheets. The consumer um, has money in the bank and the unemployment rate at 3.6 percent. Do you think we're in a recession? Uh, so I, I sort of interesting. Technically, might we be in a recession? I'll await the Atlanta Fed's GDP now for later in the day. Retail control. Uh, was better than expected, uh, but last month was revised down, and quarterly arithmetic uh, counts that more important. I uh, don't know if we are. It's not much of one because we've had 400,000 jobs nearly uh, printed each month for the last four months. I worry about the recession later in the year and, and, and next year. That will be more significant. If we're in a recession right now, it's, it's, it's mostly an inventory and a trade cycle, pretty, yeah. pretty damp. But it might just mean that the slope's going down to the more significant problems we have later in the year as the Fed tightens more. Vince, just real quick here, given the consumer data that we've seen and the fact that they do continue to spend, whether it's with credit cards or, or not, uh, their balance sheets look like they are in a pretty good position. How quickly could they turn over to achieve some of the negative scenarios that a lot of forecasters have out there? Yeah, and added to your list is the uh, retained saving from all the fiscal largesse of 2000 and 2021. That, uh, that's that's still over a trillion trillion dollars. So that helps households. Unfortunately, it helps uh, it, it it's skewed to higher income households who manage their balance sheets uh, better. So uh, I think there can be some issues going down the road. Uh, remember also that uh, yeah, the unemployment rate is three six, but real wages are declining. Uh, so actually, real household income income is is is, is going down. Uh, that will be a problem. Uh, and then the last thing to note is uh, some of uh, the benefits households have had from government policies are more forbearance, not forgiveness. Uh, uh, that's that's going away, and and that therefore will expose their balance sheets more. Uh, it's not going to be a household recession, I don't think. I th I think. Um, uh, households are better positioned in the U.S. 
Uh, not as obvious uh, in other places of the world, but but mm-hmm. the U.S. is more of a more of more of that fortress balance sheet. Vincent, thank you so much, Dr. Reinhardt, uh, with uh, uh, Dreyfus and Mellon this morning. Vincent Reinhardt, of course, is decades of work at the Federal Reserve for uh, the nation. Lisa, I looked at a chart while you were speaking there. I've never looked at, which is Ch- Chilean GDP in U.S. dollars. They've been in a malaise for six years. I mean, we don't talk about this stuff enough. I love and it. And there they are. Complete While you were malaise. speaking, I was looking at the years. Chilean peso instead. Never looked at it. No, it's a fascinating moment as they try to support their currency. And they've actually been selling some reserves as a result. Having lived in Chile, I understand what a big move this really is. We will carry forward the discussion about some of the turmoil in markets coming up on the open. As Anastasia Amoroso, chief investment strategist at iCapital, will be joining us as we take a look at a relative calm after a tumultuous week. From New York, this is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Ritika Gupta. President Biden wants Saudi Arabia to increase its oil output to help curb soaring gasoline prices in the U.S. He travels there today from Israel, but Bloomberg's learned that after the president meets with Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, there will be no public announcements on boosting oil supply. A person familiar with the matter says talks will continue regarding output from members of the OPEC Plus cartel. Senator Joe Manchin has delivered a huge blow to President Biden's ambitious economic agenda. Manchin, a Democrat, told party leaders he would not support new spending on climate measures or tax increases. Manchin says he will be back uh, will back proposals on health care and drug prices. The European Union is set to propose a new slate of sanctions on Russia for the invasion of Ukraine. Bloomberg's learned the new measures are expected to target Russian gold, introduce more trade restrictions on machinery, and add more than 50 people and entities to the sanctions list. The EU will also tighten previously approved sanctions. Well-known luxury brands are being hammered by China's COVID-0 approach. The maker of Cartier jewelry, Richemont, says sales in mainland China plunged 37% in the three months through June. The British company Burberry, known for its trench coat, saw its China sales fall 35%. Both companies said the situation started to improve last month. And that wave of airline delays in the U.S. This year is mostly self-inflicted. The share of delays caused by airlines as opposed to weather or air traffic control has surged to the highest level on record. That's according to data reviewed by Bloomberg News. Through April, airlines triggered about 58% of late flights in 2022. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. The price cap on Russian oil is one of our most powerful tools to address the pain that Americans and families across the world are feeling at the gas pump and the grocery store right now. The Secretary of Treasury, who I think is way, way more busy than any of us matter, we just had a Chilean intervention on on peso, and I would guess that she will have an international weekend and close discussion with the International Monetary Fund. An important report out moments ago, Ian Lingen, who we adore at BMO Capital Markets, flat out leads, retail sales, inconclusive for 75 basis point or 100 basis point debate. Thank you, Mr. Lingen, for that research note. We protect all of the research of our guests. Check with BMO Capital Markets for Lingen wisdom. Right now, the wisdom of Kriti Gupta on the oil fields of Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia, Tom, where you are seeing spare capacity get lower and lower and lower. One of the cushions in the oil market right now is simply that if President Biden perhaps goes to Saudi Arabia, has those discussions, will OPEC and its partners, well, specifically Saudi Arabia, really, and I wouldn't say the UAE as well, which has that spare production capacity, can they turn on the taps and help this global energy crisis, of course, in the war, in the wake of the war in Ukraine? And that brings me to my chart of the day about just how much ability they have to do that, specifically Saudi Arabia. Here we're looking 
looking at their entire production capacity minus how much production they actually have. In other words, how much spare capacity does Saudi Arabia actually have? We're going back about 10 years, the, or I say 20 years. The first 10 years of the century, you are seeing an uptrend, then a downtrend, and then it goes even further. A lot of the having to do with the shale boom, the COVID story, Houthi attacks coming from Yemen. The end of the, the chart, the big takeaway here is that Saudi capacity is not where it was at, say, at the beginning of the century. And that is dangerous for an oil market that is perhaps depending to some extent that they can simply turn on the taps, Tom. Uh, Kriti Gupta, thank you so much. If you are in the oil business, you must read cover to cover Daniel Jurgen's classic, the prize, even to this day, 20, 30, 40 years old, it's still definitive uh, read. Will Kennedy joins us now, senior executive editor for all of energy and commodities, who's read the prize three or four times, cover to cover. Chapter 21, Will Kennedy, the post-war petroleum order. How does President Biden want to change the petroleum order on this historic afternoon in Jeddah? He wants to make up with Saudi Arabia, essentially, and, and he wants Saudi Arabia to have uh, America's back in helping them to manage uh, the oil market in a way that, that suits the uh, U.S. economy. Those conversations haven't been happening as much as they used to. I mean, they've been happening in the last few months as uh, people have prepared for this trip. Um, and, you know, he wants them to keep happening. Uh, he wants Saudi help. Now, as Kriti explained, there is perhaps not as much help as the U.S. would like. But I do think the conversations have evolved in an important way. From what I understand is that in, the, in Washington, there's a recognition that they shouldn't pump all the oil they can now, that, that it's in everyone's interest to maintain um, some measure of spare capacity in case we get well, a bad hurricane later this year. So what that means is he may down the line get some more OPEC oil, but no one's expecting it to be a flood of OPEC oil, so, so, a, a little bit more. Well, what it looks like is that candidate Biden wanted to project an image of someone who was going to change the petroleum world order. But President Biden realizes he can't do that and must maintain the status quo. Is that the case? I think you could I, I think you could put it like that. Absolutely. Um, and of course, one of the things that has really changed in the petroleum order um, and it will probably shake the order for years to come is the war in Ukraine. Um, and, and that's forcing people to reevaluate things. Well, in, in what sense? I mean, it looks like Europe, for example, isn't buying Russian oil. So Russia sells it to the Indians and Chinese um, and, and they uh, turn it into the kinds of products that the Europeans need in the end. They do buy it. There is some truth in that, of course, but we should remember that the war has uh, meant that we've lost about a million barrels a day of Russian production. That's quite a lot at the margin. That's 1% of or thereabouts of, of global production. That's had a, a big impact. We've lost a lot of access to Russians refining uh, capacity. That's had a big impact on the price of diesel, especially in Europe. Um, so it, it, the, the impact has perhaps not been quite as huge as people expected at the start of the war, but it has been significant nonetheless and should not not be dismissed. Well, the, the level of surprise here of Brent crude, 124, uh, down to wherever we are right now, 102. We're down $20 on Brent crude. Should we be surprised or is that normal in your world? I think there are two things that have really put a lot of pressure on, on Brent over the last few months. Uh, and they're, they're related, of course. One is that people are concerned that there will be a recession, and that means that demand may not shrink, but it will grow perhaps less quickly than people expected. Um, and secondly, we've had a really strong dollar, and traditionally that's very bad for the oil price, and I think we've seen a lot of that there. But what's important, and people are trying to understand, is there's a real contrast between the futures price and what we're seeing in the physical right. market, where things look still very tight. Will and that's what's got to be resolved. Yeah. Will, thank you so much. Greatly appreciate it. From Queen Victoria Street here, our senior executive editor for Hydrocarbons here, where the president uh, will visit uh, Jetta here in a short order. In the time we've got left, I think we've got to take advantage of Matt Miller's encyclopedic knowledge of a Germany, not flat on its back, but certainly a Germany, to use the cliche, in original territory. 
Matt, what is the anecdote you have heard about the panic in a heated July as Germany confronts a less heated November and on to a frigid January? Well, the real concern is um, what they're going to do about powering their factories right now. Come January, obviously, they're going to have to heat their homes. But rationing is the big concern that you hear that you hear about now. And um, finding alternative sources of energy, uh, it doesn't seem like they're having much success there. They're falling back on the big coal reserves that they have, but they're not willing to turn around their plan to shut down nuclear completely by the end of the year. It is an image from Jetta. Anne-Marie Horder now with a uh, pass that she had as she's on the White House charter with the president. I'm not sure if she's sitting next to the president or just a couple rows uh, back. But regardless, it is a shock to see Tel Aviv to Jetta, and we see that now with the president on a unimaginable trip, looking over any number of conflicts and legitimate wars back at least to 1948. For me, it is a course about the shock of 1967, the shock and surprise of Carter and Sadat and the Sadat assassination, as we saw in Japan this week, always a time for a nation and a region to stop. And now we see diplomacy. Matt Miller, what is so important here is the diplomacy of a president with the courage to go south to Jeddah. Uh, absolutely. Um, that's what we're seeing here. I think it would be interesting, and a lot of people have said he may want to go to South uh, Texas, really, and look at um, how he can boost oil production here rather than there. Although, as we can see, um, <laughs> you know, the truth of the matter... Yeah. Is he's in Saudi Arabia and not in Oklahoma. A truly historic moment here on the Red Sea. Our Emory Horton will be reporting through the day. I believe the temperature is 100 degrees in Jeddah as it's across 110 in the heat of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia summer. Please stay with us on Wall Street Week tonight. Our guests, David Bianco, Lori Calvacina, Greg Fleming, and Professor Summers, also in attendance, Lisa Abramowitz. This is Bloomberg 